What's going on, everybody? I should have known this would happen, and I really did think about it as soon as I did. But if you are, if you know me at all, uh, you know that the webcam never works the first time. It's nearly at this point a running joke, except that it's not a joke. It's just a big old goof. If you do know me, then you know this really does happen all the time. And this stream's going to be a funny one. I mean, I really mean it when I say I don't have a plan. Uh, we are just hanging out. We'll talk a little bit of draft. We'll talk very in specific and then we'll rack it up. Uh, we just did a big old mock draft over at the ONTAP Sportsnet uh, building the board, basically project. And that was great. I mean, it was grand, right? Um, perfect. We're finally rolling here. And at that point, like, if you want to go see some draft content, me, Quentin, uh, Quentin Crisco, Stephen Letizia, and Jeff Hughes of DeBear's blog basically talked through a bunch of Bears draft stuff. And I'll recap a, couple, a little bit of it here. I mean, this is an incredibly short notice stream. I did no real promoting of it, so I get it. Uh, we're just going to be talking through anything. If you guys want to watch a, some quick tape, let me know in the chat who you want to watch. I mean, I really mean it when I say I have no plan here. And the nice thing is, is that we're going into a draft weekend where I don't really have an exceptionally long shopping list for the Bears. I mean, I would love, I would love at this point to tell you that I am on pins and needles about, hey, Kasim, thanks so much for subscribing. Appreciate you. Uh, I would love to tell you that I'm on pins and needles for anybody specific that the Bears are going to draft, but I can tell you that in my honest opinion, I think that there are a million ways that you can cut this thing. Like you can draft a, an offensive guard. You can draft a tackle. You can draft a defensive tackle. You could draft an edge rusher. You could draft a superstar wide receiver. You pretty much just don't need a running back at number nine. Probably wouldn't draft Brock Bowers. I don't think fits, but even he, man, like, or woman, I could talk myself into Brock Bowers in his Chicago Bears uniform. The guy is really really good and so i can't help taking a look at everything that we're gonna see right e e everything that we could possibly see on number nine I if they trade up down for it if they trade down here for it if they stay where they are pick where they are here for it i mean i don't want to sound like i don't know right like here's what i think is complicated Th this is how i feel okay normally normally I'm somebody with a pretty strong opinion. Do you, don't you guys know that? Like, I can be pretty flexible. We all know that. But normally I'm somebody that will tell you like I think it is, for better and for worse. And I generally want the Bears to go a certain way. And if they don't, then I have to, like, cope with it for a little bit. And then we get hip to it, blah, blah, blah. We've been down this road before. The, especially those of you who have been rocking with me for a while. We know that I'll, I'll tell you like I think it is. There are a lot of ways to build this team. In trading for Montez Sweat, you have given yourself the absolute basis need at pass rusher. Do I think you need one more? I do, to be honest with you. I think it's the biggest, I think it's the current biggest need on the team. I think you need a second pass rusher just because I think having one and only one established pass rusher leaves you way too vulnerable to sweat getting hurt. And then the Bears offensive line is totally dependent on Gervon Dexter and Demarcus Walker coming through for them. And who knows, maybe they could, right? It's not even to say that the Bears are totally in the woods the moment that, that happens. I think that it's the main position I look at and say they are really vulnerable there. But even if they don't do much at pass rusher, it could be worse. I mean, it could be what they started the season with. And there are some creative solutions that they can employ. Like they pulled the sweat trade off once. They could theoretically pull off another trade and immediately put themselves or immediately at another pass rusher if they decided to go for, say, Odunze or... Fatanu or Joe Alt or uh, Fashanu or any of the other litany of draft picks that the Bears may go with this year. And, and I'm with you, Ryan. You mentioned that the excitement is more at pick nine than 101 this year, which is bizarre to say, but I agree with you that at least when it comes to the Bears right now, there's just no drama at 101. If you remember, Ryan, 101 was dramatic for weeks months even we talked about 101 as early as september so uh, on this channel but it's not the best moment when you look back but especially starting january etc we did 101 for a very long time we just don't need to do it anymore kind of feels settled right uh so nine is more dramatic but 
the main thing I guess I want to say is as your resident Bears film analyst, I think there are a lot of ways that you can make the team better. I think there are a couple ways that you can make the team the most better, right? Like, I'll tell you up front, I think that Byron Murphy is really special when I watch his tape. It, does that mean he's automatically going to be special? No, but I see a legitimate ceiling. Whereas with Dallas Turner, I feel like I'm having to talk myself into a ceiling, and I know he'll come, he'll end up a couple rungs short of really great. With Byron Murphy, I think that with a little bit of refinement, he goes from very good to potentially great and if he's as disruptive as and healthy as i would hope that he would be the 21 year old kid out of texas could end up being a real problem on the defensive side of the ball then i think the receivers are all going to be pretty sweet i mean adunze is the one i think i have the most questions with but part of that's also because receiver in some level is about branding uh and that's not me hating right if marvin harris so marvin harrison let's use marvin harrison as an example right Marvin Harrison is a buttery smooth, buttery smooth uh, route runner. Phenomenal guy, right? He is not a yak artist. And so that means that if Marvin Harrison ends up getting drafted by the Patriots, which I don't think the Patriots are going to draft him, right? But if he got drafted by the Patriots, he would be almost totally at the mercy of his quarterback because he'd catch the occasional curl route. He'd get the occasional slant. But unlike Malik Neighbors, who's basically an offense in a bottle, because Malik, very similar to DJ, is really hard to tackle, so bursty that he could take a layup throw and turn it into a touchdown or turn it into a highlight. Whereas Marvin Harrison is really good at creating separation, but now you need the quarterback to deliver you a strike to pick up all those yards, right? Really helpful to have, but a little more at the mercy of situation as far as success goes than sometimes I think we talk about in this draft cycle, right? We do this every year. Let me know if you get what I'm saying, right? Like we do this every year where we talk about receivers as if they're absolute slam dunk sure things like Sammy Watkins. And we say, yeah, I mean, you, there are some fun receivers further down the draft, but we just have too many questions about guys like Odell Beckham Jr. and DK Metcalf. And then what do you know? Odell Beckham Jr. is Odell. Uh, hi, Michael. How you doing? And then DK Metcalf is DK Metcalf. Both of these guys, I believe, are second rounders. I mean, fact check me on um, on uh, or Metcalf. I know, but fact check me on uh, on Odell. I just know that he wasn't early, early. Sammy Watkins was early, early. Right? Jerry Judy was the first receiver drafted. I believe C.D. Lamb got drafted after him. Uh, Justin Jefferson was not the first receiver drafted within his own draft. This is before you dig into guys like Stefan Diggs. This is before you dig into guys like Tyree Kill. Guys that fell for very different reasons. Or guys like, um, thank you, Reinhardt. So OBJ wasn't first drafted, but he was still really high. That makes sense. But even so, like you, you look at receivers like... Um, I'm not going to let that dissuade the point because the point is more generic than just Odell. It's it's this idea of receiver matters. It matters like who you are as a receiver for sure. But as far as who takes that next step, who becomes that guy, that's as much up to how the receiver grows and who's throwing him the ball as it is the talent level of that receiver. I mean, Devontae Adams, obviously we know him now as Devontae Adams, but we might have known him as Keon Coleman. Not literally. Don't take that too seriously. Like. We, we might have known him as Keon Coleman another time or Lad McConkey. Lad McConkey could end up back in the first round, maybe as late as the mid second. It's not feeling like he's going to get that far right now. And I know I'm one of those guys that's been like, Lad McConkey will get there. I am beginning to question my own faith, right? More just to say that there are ways to scoop up a receiver a little later in the draft that could be really productive for you. But I'm right there. Well, that's the thing, Michael. Right. Um, and Jordan and Chicago, how you doing? And Reinhardt. I, I, that's the other piece of this, though. The football head inside of me says that if this team wants to be holistic, they need a second pass rusher. Right. Because that's the problem here. The Bears have two sick corners. I mean, maybe three if you want to count Gordon. I think you can count Gordon. Um, so, but they've got two sweet corners and then a fun one. They've got a safety in Kevin Byard that I think has a lot to bring to the table and a Nitro linebacker in Jaquan Brisker that can be a lot of fun in the box. So they've got investment there, if nothing else. Uh, then they've got two linebackers that can play. But I think we'd all agree that while their run defense is pretty solid, 
their pass rush is not, right? And we we know. But Reinhardt said it perfectly that he just doesn't want to end up with the Bears in a flat circle. Like time's a flat circle moment where once again, we invest again on the defense. Once again, the defense is good. Once again, the offense suffers because the defense got all the money. I hear that. I really do. And that that's the other piece to this, right? Is if the Bears draft a Dunze, stoked. If the Bears um if the Bears draft a tackle, I'll think it's weird, but I'll end up rocking with it. I would almost rather they draft a guy they think is a badass guard. But I'm not trying to stand for Braxton too hard in that case. It's more like, at least for me, it is strange the idea that we would replace a stable tackle who can play at an NFL average level. That's not easy, right? And immediately make him a rookie blindside protector, which is worse. Right. Like the idea that a rookie would just hot drop in and play better than Braxton feels more difficult than we're letting on sometimes. But that's just me. Right. You could disagree. Go for it. If you wanted to tell me that you thought Olu Fashenu or Fashenu is the best player available at nine. OK. I mean, I have no problem with that. I really don't. I, I kind of end up feeling as if the board is lining up for a little bit of a trade down. Find a way to get a second round pick take a receiver in the second round. And I think there are a lot of options there. I mean, I couldn't believe this on the mock draft show, but I've totally talked myself into if they take worthy, like, okay, I can see it. And I'll talk you, I'll, I'll try to talk you into it too. Right. But like you're saying, uh, four P's flus is a defensive coach. If you want to see him elevate the bears defense, I don't blame you. Right. I, uh, I don't blame a single bears fan. I don't blame a single Bears fan, right, for wanting to see the Bears invest in offense just to prove they can. Because as neat as it would be to draft Caleb Williams, I mean, that's the other piece of this, right, is I, I like to think all of us Bears fans agree that Keenan Allen and DJ Moore is a lot more support than, oh, and Cole Komet, whatever you think of him, plus Gerald Everett, solid second tight end, and De uh, DeAndre Sweat, like, or DeAndre Swift, that's going to get me every time. This is a solid little cast. We don't need to over, what, over-dramatize it, but it's a solid cast. Like, especially DJ, or especially DJ and Keenan, those give you legitimate number one options for most scenarios in football. You need a short route, you need an option route, Keenan's your guy. You need a big play, DJ's right there. You want to run double slants? Go for it. Like, I'm with you, Reinhardt, that... Trusting Keenan's health is kind of a separate question. Trusting the longevity of this whole thing is a separate question. But at least Reinhardt, I mean, okay, so Reinhardt, if we think about this as um as quarterback development is two phases, right? And, and I'm gonna or let's make it three, okay? So phase number one over here on the left, or I'm gonna go uh, here. I have to remember to reverse it. Envision this third, right? This is OTAs, training camp, preseason, right? It is the before the season actually happens part. And at that part, you would think that even though you're not playing games, the quarterback is going to catch up to NFL speed. And it's going to be really helpful that the DBs are good and the wide receivers are good. And Keenan's there to kind of coach him through the overarching ideas of what this thing's going to look like. Then you get into phase two, right? This is the early season, like the first half of the season. I would hope Keenan can play the majority of that, right? So then we get to cement a lot of the lessons we learned in phase one within phase two. And then phase three over here, you sort of put it all together in the back half of the season, maybe the playoffs. I'm with you that Keenan may not get there. Like, wait, we just don't know, right? And that's where I think you need a second, or you need a wide receiver in the second round at least. And guys like Jalen Polk out of Washington, guys like Lad McConkey. Guys like Keon Coleman, guys like Xavier Worthy, guys like Ricky Pearsall. Uh, I'm not a huge Leggett, Leggett guy, but if you needed to, you could go with Leggett. Like, you'll have some options when you go and get that receiver, but they're not Roma Dunze. <laughs> they're, not, they're not Malik Neighbors. Somebody mentioned earlier that they would trade up for Malik Neighbors. Neighbors is the guy that I think I've come to like the most. I mean, he's the most obviously explosive. He's an offense in a bottle. He's totally my type of receiver. I love the small guys that are just unbelievably explosives. Um, and he's not even that small. 
He's like six one. I four P. I think Jermaine Burton is more of a character question, and I always find those ugly to talk about. To be honest with you, just because I don't know, and that's where I have to turn into the most speculative, speculative person or the most speculative and obnoxious person possible. And I have to tell you what I assume people are saying. And I feel like it's just a rumor mill generator, right? I have no idea. Uh, and Ryan mentions, what is a worse situation? Having no competent edge players if sweat goes down or no wider or, or lacking a wide receiver if, uh, or at wide receiver if Allen goes down. Ryan, that's sort of the problem here. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got two camps, okay? Because which is worse objectively? The edge one is like if you if you if sweat goes down, Andrew Billings becomes your best pass rusher until Gervon Dexter changes your mind. Right. And you don't know that he will. We hope so. Kudos to Big Dex. Big fan of his. Think he's got a lot of pass rush tape that he showed us that is legitimately exciting. But I won't believe it until I see it. Right. That one's worse. But that's not Caleb Williams. Right. Like Chicago fanatic. That's the problem here, isn't it? is even if Keenan Allen goes down, you have DJ Moore. If Montez Sweat goes down, you do not have a DJ Moore equivalent. The argument I would make is that DJ Moore is better than Keenan Allen is anyways. Like, I love Keenan Allen. We went crazy watching Keenan Allen. I think the guy's a beast, right? But DJ is a dude. He's a whole dude and a half. I'm not worried of the Bears receiving room so long as the Bears have both of these guys because one insulates the other. If DJ misses time, you have a guy that's used to being the wide receiver one and he can still wear that hat. Then if Keenan goes down, you have a guy that wore that hat all of last year. The problem is, uh, Ryan, the number one overall pick plays offense. So if you said the defense doesn't really matter, that at the end of the day, you want to see the quarterback developed no matter what, well, then add the wide receiver, right? Because chances are the wide receiver is going to make you feel better. I'm being serious. I mean, look, it's all entertainment at the end of the day. You and I don't get to say. I won't be surprised if the Bears see this. I should make this clear, okay? Because we've been live for 20 some odd minutes at this point. Um, but I think if they add a wide receiver, that's sweet. I think if they add a defensive player and they also add a second wide receiver, that's sweet too. I don't really have a preference. I could tell you for the sake of trying to cool off arguments online that, oh, I prefer the wide receiver. I'm good with both, right? But the, and that's the thing, Reinhardt, like holistically, sure, but exactly, Rob, offense is what matters more now, 100%, right? I would tell you, Reinhardt, that I think the team being cohesive Matters a lot, right? Uh, Reinhardt, envision this, okay? I'm going to turn you into the nerdiest nerd, right? Maybe I did get more defensive-minded as Chicago. I completely am fine with that. I really am. The, the other thing that Reinhardt I would talk about, okay, is for a moment that uh, – wait, let me see. Chicago, what do you mean? Oh, did I get you more defensively-minded? Is that what you're saying? Anyways, Reinhardt, Reinhardt, let's do this, okay? Envision being in the locker room, right, Reinhardt? Envision the quarterback is throwing a solid 260 yards a game, okay? We are going crazy. You, you, me, everybody else, we're really excited. Caleb is maybe not balling, like he's playing really well, especially for a rookie, but we're very excited about him. But the Bears are losing because they don't have any pass rush, right? Envision being in the locker room. You know what I'm saying? Like envision... After a couple weeks, they're five and seven. R rookie playing well, but they lost Montez Sweat to a shoulder dislocation in week three. It's never been right. He's like, he is not playing well at this point, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Following so far. The, the point that I'm trying to make here is in the locker room, how does everybody feel? Right? Um, how, like, is Caleb. It, are we, I'm sure Caleb would be trying to lead. Let's not make more, a meal out of this. But when they're going through the film room, is Caleb learning in a healthy way? Is Caleb patting himself on the back and saying, hey, I'm doing, I'm doing what I need to do? Or does Caleb start to 
lean into bad habits because he's trying to manufacture wins against a defense that, just like USC, isn't able to hold them. Now, I don't want to make the defense out to be more dire than it is, right, Reinhardt? What I'm trying to say is, at the end of the day, I think, you guys tell me if I'm nuts. Truly, truly, I'm fine being nuts here. I think we have hit the point where the offense is in an acceptable state, if only just, right? Uh, I I think they need another receiver. I can't say that enough. If they pick at nine, I will advocate for them to trade into the second round. And I'm normally not the guy to do that, right? Because I think they need a receiver. It doesn't matter if it's Ricky Pearsall. It doesn't matter if it's Xavier Leggett. It doesn't matter if it's Xavier Worthy. It doesn't matter if it's... Um, it doesn't matter if it's Lad McConkey, Keon Coleman. It, it doesn't matter if I like him. Malachi Corley, I don't care, right? You can't have Tyler Scott as your wide receiver three. I think we all know that, right? But also, I want the team to be able to win. Partially, you could say, oh, Robert, aren't you just leaning into this because you want them to win so that you can cover a winning team? I mean, a little, right? But also, I think if they're dapping each other up after wins and they're going through and they're fixing mistakes on the back of wins, that part of what you got from C.J. Stroud was the confidence that he was winning. You get both, right? This vision we have, okay? I have only seen it once. L l truly, sit back, type it in. I want this to be a discussion. I'm not trying to just rant to you. It's a stream. I get a one-way vehicle, right? But I have only seen one quarterback actually do the thing where he's a stat eater on a losing team and we all think he's really good. And that's Justin Herbert. It doesn't normally happen, right? Normally, the team with the good quarterback also wins the games because he puts up good stats on a good team, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like, am I missing something? I can't help but sit here and think even with all that worry about, guys, Geronimo Allison, Geronimo Allison scored touchdowns on us because Aaron Rodgers was a baller. Was Randall Cobb ever a thousand yard receiver? Because it felt like he was in Green Bay. Was Jordy Nelson as good as we make him out to be? Especially given that he caught for a billion yards while he was in Green Bay. James Jones scored on us like it wasn't trouble. Is there a point, just begging the question, okay, where Tyler Scott could surprise us if Caleb is that dude? And specifically, you got to remember, like, Reinhardt, you mentioned worrying about Keenan's health. Can he make it four to seven games? Because if he can, you got to hope that Caleb can pivot in a similar way to the way that Stroud did when Tank Dell went down. S similar but different, right? Where I can't, I'm just more thinking, out loud about the idea that the Bears have two sweet receivers, which is one sweet receiver more than most teams, right? He's old. Obviously, we've got some injury problems. And obviously, the Bears are going to want to sign probably a veteran. I'm just being real with you guys. If they somehow didn't end up with a second round wide receiver, a guy like Tyler Boyd makes a lot of sense. And he's still on the market. Like, there are some options here. Maybe they swing a trade for Ayuk. I don't know. Anything's on the table at that point because you got Caleb Williams. Like, the Bears are going to make moves at receiver. I just think we as a fan base are not talking about how poor their pass rush looks right now because, to be honest, we don't want to acknowledge the problem. And I don't blame anybody. This is an offense. This team needs to be led by its offense. Needs to be. Right? Don't we agree? Caleb has to be good. We need to do what we can to support Caleb being good. Nothing else feels like it matters. The problem is, how you doing? Anytime, Wu. Uh, the problem we're seeing, I think we've, Chicago Fanatic mentioned that I've defense pilled him. I'll say something that I try not to be like too scary on, the, uh, on this show because I don't think it's fun, right? The problem that I'm having, because John, here's at least what I'm seeing, is that if you don't have a pass rush, you are wasting the investment you made in the secondary and the linebackers, right? Like, if you can't rush the passer at all, then your secondary's ability to cover makes no real difference. Defense is a team sport. It all works together. And so, hey, if we're down to blitz more, I'll let go of it. But Flus doesn't want to, 
We abandoned the blitz as soon as we thought we had a pass rush. We we did. And so if we're going to do that, then a guy like Byron Murphy makes more sense to me because I think he's nasty. But at the same time, if the Bears want to go offense, if they want to drop Brock Powers, if they want to send A.D. Mitchell, if they want to send it with Brian Thomas, if they're down, if they if they're down to trade up a little bit, maybe go up to eight, go get Roma Dunze. Sure. Absolutely no problem with that. No problem with that. Like, I'm down for whatever because you're going to have a hard time convincing me that unless the Bears drafted Troy Taylor or Tory Taylor at number nine, that the team gets worse, right? They are a young team. They are ascending. They're adding a sweet player at the most important position in football. They've got the bones of a young, talented offense with enough veterans to make it work. They've got some really solid defenders that are all coming together at the right time. This thing is working. The Ryan Poles has actually built this really well. But I do think they are a pass rusher away. And when Keenan is gone, they will be an extra receiver away. And I think we all know that. It's why there's such a debate. Don't you agree? Because the both of these picks are totally sensible. And they totally help the team in 2025 and beyond. I think in 2024, if everything goes according to plan, whoever the Bears pick won't end up with more than 90 targets. Does that matter? I don't know. Your call, right? Was it really er 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 erotic? That's exciting. I'm so excited about that. I really am. Like, um, I'm excited to hear it popped off. I mean, look, the work we do at DBB is, uh, thank you guys for putting up with me. It's not been amazing. Like, uh, er, er, it's not been amazing. I wish that I could push more time into it. A lot's been going on in my life, which is not to, (laughs) it's more like I've been taking care of family stuff. Family stuff matters. Always does. Always will. But it's meant that things like nine at nine, et cetera, et cetera, have all ended up getting delayed more than I'd like to admit, because I just don't have the time to make the article I want to. But I thought Kyle did a great job. I was really proud of what he was able to put together and edit it the way that I or and edit it the way that I did. I think the two of us did a really good job. And that's the stuff that if I could, I would want DVB to have more of, right? But instead you get me streaming. And that works too, right? <laughs> Preston, I kind of feel very I kind of feel similarly, right? The hardest part about Edge Rusher, just as we talk about this, right? The hardest part about Edge Rusher is that it's a lot harder to find a good edge rusher that uh in the second third fourth round than it is to find a good receiver in the second third fourth round like john you mentioned if those 90 targets turn into 60 catches the same yard per reception at metcalf that's a thousand yard season uh, you know who could do that xavier worthy you don't need a number nine over a pick for xavier worthy xavier worthy also might totally bust right like it's and, and yes, Reinhardt, that's probably a good way to put it. The defense, a defense, moreover, you say it's the sum of its parts. Reinhardt, I think a defense is a weak link game, right? The Bears have a defense that is quickly becoming short of weak links. Like the Bears defense doesn't have a lot of weak links. This is how you suffocate offenses and beat the tar out of or out of a couple of teams. Like, oh my gosh, Reinhardt, just envision this, right? Like, Let's talk it out. The Lions, okay? The Lions right now have a solid one and a half receivers, depending on what you're counting Laporta. I think we all agree Laporta is awesome, right? But a tight end can only do so much. The Bears squared up Tyreek Stevenson on him, and he didn't really go anywhere, right? So then they put Jalen Johnson on Amon Ross St. Brown for the majority of the game, and they shadowed him with with Kyler Gordon shaded inside, and the Lions' passing game suddenly had no answers. Whatever Eberflus did, I was surprised more teams didn't copy it because they shut the Lions down twice. I understand they won the second game. <laughs> We're all on the same page there. But it was really impressive to see what they did against the Lions. And if you had a little more interior pressure, maybe you do it from the edge. But if you had a little more interior pressure, Reinhardt, you're going pre- to get Goff off his spot that much more. You're going to push the ball into places it doesn't need to go. You're going to create that little bit more chaos. And again, I'm not trying to defense pill anybody, right? But you actually are going to create major problems that Sam Darnold isn't going to be able to solve in Minnesota. Now, 
are you going to beat the Packers? I hope so, right? They did not have the pass rush juice to beat the Packers, which sucked. Like, I'm not a big fan of that, but that's life. They need a guy who can whoop ass a little bit, or they're not going to be able to pressure Jordan Love because Montez Sweat got handled. And that's not Hayden. It's more like the Packers line is good. You need a couple guys that are all capable of winning because you're only going to get like one guy to bleed through and pressure Love. Then he might throw you a couple uh, balls off his back foot. Those could turn into interceptions. But that's a whole separate conversation. The problem is, is that we've got a rookie quarterback. And until he shows that he is Aaron Rodgers, nobody's going to believe it, and they're all going to want to see him get supported. I don't blame any of you guys for this. Now, is Lad McConkey like John, you mentioned, what if that receiver produces really well? Totally, right? Lad McConkey could end up being a demon with even 60 catches in a year. I think so. Like, let's, uh, let's go to a film lineup just to talk this out, right? If you had, we are, I guess we are vaguely discussing that overall. If you had a formation like this, right? And you had Lad McConkey on this side and Keenan's going to run an option route. Okay. So he's going to slant in. He's going to what break out or he's going to run a post or something like that. And then to clear space for it, you've got Xavier worthy running an alert over the top right here. That's going to be worthy. And then on the backside, You've got DJ Moore running. Let's see what would be decent play design here. Uh, probably, probably like a curl. It's boring, but there you go. Right at this point, you can chain off of Keenan Allen because the moment that they don't end up respecting what Worthy can do down the field, Caleb's got the arm to just pop the defense over the top, and you don't have to do it often. He'll just walk into the end zone now and again. Right. Um, but also, guys like Lad McConkey, if you create the space, like let's say now Keenan's over here, his option route is going to happen a little further on the outside. He's going to either run a slant, he's going to run an out, or he's going to fade up the sidelines. And then on this side of the ball, you're just going to have a basic drive concept, right? This guy, let's say it's Kmet, because they put Kmet in these trip punches all the time. Uh, Kmet is going to uh, run an out route, but it's really meant as a pick for Lad McConkey coming over the middle and DJ Moore coming uh, coming across on a dig route or something like that. If you got McConkey the ball on one of these, like underneath routes, that guy is a problem with the ball in his hand. I mean, not as much as some, but he's really fast. So is Worthy. And so I can't help looking at just what the Bears can offer. Like Khalid mentions Roman Wilson. Roman Wilson's a solid little option for something like this. I think Jalen Polk is a beast. Like, it's not me trying to chain too often. It's not me trying to get you excited about nothing. Right, John? It's more like we are talking about, because we all acknowledge that Roma Dunze and Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr. are in an S tier of their own, I kind of think we're leaving unsaid that this second class, or the second tier of receivers is also really good. I, I would tell you with a straight face, John, I think a lot of the guys we've talked about, Keon Coleman, Lad McConkey, et cetera, et cetera, I think a lot of these guys would end up being late first rounders, and they still might. It's possible. But that in a normal draft, they would be back half of the first guys, right? Like, I'm going to ask something maybe a little drastic. You may not agree with me on this, but where would Jordan Addison be in this class, right? I still think he'd be good. I still think most would consider him pretty good. But would he still get taken 22nd? I don't know. Because I think, I think he'd be at best wide receiver five. But I don't know if he'd be wide receiver five. And that's not me hating. That's me saying this class of receiver is really good. Because it's really good, you would end up or because it's really good, I think in the middle of the second round, you're going to be able to get a player that should have been in a high second rounder, or should have been a high second rounder. And that's all I'm really getting at, John. Envision a 10-pick uh, depression of value. I think if the Bears can get a middle second rounder, like 45, 50, that they have a shot at collecting a receiver that shouldn't have really been there. And that can be something that I think we could all appreciate. But also, 
to Reinhardt's point, if they trade back and they draft a defender and then you get to wherever the Bears are picking, let's say they're picking at 52 and all of the cool receivers are gone, well, the whole thing busted, <laughs> right? <laughs> then it doesn't work. The gamble o- or the gambit only pays off if you manage the pass rusher and the receiver and we're happy with both, right? And I mean, again, could you add Malachi Corley and he ends up surprising? It's always possible, right? Could you add Xavier Leggett and it turns out he's a stud? It's always possible. I never want to close the door. I do. I want to be somebody with opinions, so I'm trying here. But there's a lot of ways to create production out of your wide receiver room. There's a lot of ways to manifest a rookie second rounder into a wide receiver two that plays off of DJ Moore. A lot of ways. And especially if Caleb has... If Caleb's good, right, then who does this guy really have to be? I mean that seriously. Like, yes, of course, we want him to be dangerous. But if Caleb is maximizing his wide receivers, then you might see the best out of a lot of these guys. A lot of these guys. Do we remember Tyler Scott is actually quite good with the ball in his hand? No, because we aren't going to throw him a crosser, right? Like some little shallow across the field. Like you can... You can pop that right there and then bang, he'll get up the field and he can make a, or like he can do things. Give me just a moment, everybody. This is Jared verse. I'll just roll some tape.
We're back. We're back. All right, so what have we seen on the verse tape? Because I'll tell you what I think is funny. This guy is not a lateral player at all. Like, he does not have any wiggle in him, but he blasts straight through his tackle often. Like, when you talk about a, an almost Madden-created edge two, verse actually makes a lot of sense for this. Huge problem in the run game, so he's going to turn the play the other direction, and also he is going to pressure the passer. He's not going to finish a ton of the sacks, but he is going to move the quarterback off his spot. He practically plays like a three technique, playing at edge in terms of just the way he creates pressure, right? But pressure is pressure, which helps. And then, Andre, you mentioned you need another or you need a top edge or a top interior lineman and then a quality wide receiver. I agree with you. To me, what's funny, okay? Like, tell me if I'm being ridiculous. I might be in this case. If Joe Alt or if JC Latham or if Troy Fontanu or if Olu Fashinu were Quinton Johnson or Quinton Nelson. I would entertain it a lot more. Right now, I think the Bears' interior is way more suspect than we're giving it credit for. We really like Tevin Jenkins. I'm kind of surprised they haven't extended him yet. I wonder what that means about his future. Just saying, right? So if, especially if Jenkins isn't part of the picture, which we don't know. It's hearsay until it's not, right? But Davis is a question mark. We know that. We hope he bounces back. I think he'll bounce back. But bounce back to where? To okay? Right? And then center. We've got Ryan Bates. Bates is fun. Bates Bates works better than it's been. Like the center the, the parade of centers that the Bears have had has been so poor that if the Bears end up okay at center, then that's an awfully good thing. The part to me that's bugged me about upgrading offensive line at nine is that it's a tackle. And Braxton's not that bad. Like, yes, of course, we'd all love for him to be even better, but that's what I'm, that's kind of what I'm getting at, Arafik, right? Is the Bears need an offensive line is in the interior. They desperately need, I think, more juice there eventually, right? But the that doesn't mean that you can just take a tackle and automatically call your line better. You'd hope it's better, but it might not be that much better. And if it isn't, it wouldn't have anything to do with the tackle. There is a chance. I think we'll all agree with this. There is a chance you take Joe Alt and your offensive line gets no better. Not better, not worse. Alt could even be a better player, but you're already living and dying by what happens on the interior. And that doesn't change just because you threw Joe Alt at the problem, right? Now, your line could get better if you draft a sick receiver, whether that's in the first or the second round. Because guys that get open faster, give Caleb an outlet. When you get an outlet, you're able to get the ball out. When you get the ball out, you're able to, uh, like, when you get the ball out, you're able to avoid, or you're able to avoid pressure. And as such, you make your offensive line better. Like, because of this, at least for me, I keep looking at offensive tackle pretty sideways, right? Because if you, let's see, the Bears need to create the highest floor uh, for our offensive line this year. Introducing a rookie tackle lowers the floor, even if he gets better than Braxton in year two. Uh, John, I actually agree with that. I think the time to replace Braxton is next year. If you wanted to draft a developmental offensive tackle that you could then bring into the fold next year, okay, I, I hear you. Sure, like you could do that. But if you end up, what's it, or but, but if you're trying to start him as a rookie, I don't personally think it makes a lot of sense with the timeline of the team, but okay. If that's what Ryan Poles wants to do, I'll rock with it. It's just not my preference. I mean, my preference is kind of something Reinhardt mentioned earlier. Like, Spectre, you mentioned, what do you think about a drop to later in the first and grabbing a mid-second? Dude, that's what I want, Spectre. Like, if I got to pick right now, I would try to get the Colts or the uh, Saints on the phone. Here, I'll show you, right? We can do this. And again, for anybody who wasn't here at the top of the show, this show is being pretty much like rift top to bottom. Uh, we're, we're just going to talk for a little bit, probably close up shop around like 11, 1130. I really promise like I need to go to sleep and you guys probably need to go to sleep. We'll do a better draft stream like next week or something, but it's funny, right? At least this season, and I apologize if you were looking for more, it, at least this season, 
I'm planning on going a lot harder on analyzing the team that is as opposed to projecting the team that might be. There's been enough moving parts all offseason that we're so close to just knowing who the team is. And I'm starting to think that that's going to be way more fun to, t- to talk about rather than projecting, oh, well, what about, what about, what about, what about, especially since they have four picks at the moment. But so what do I think is going to happen, right? I think you take it. Shocker, right? Won't shock me if the board falls not exactly like this, but not dissimilar, right? Where you don't get a wide receiver option. So then who's the best choice here, right? Uh, I personally think that there's plenty of directions that you could go with this, but the aim that I would be looking at, McFly guy, how you doing? So I've been thinking about this, okay? And I'm glad that they showed this one. There's a team I think wants Brock Bowers, okay? It's a team that has a head coach who has used his tight end more than most uh, coaches that I've seen over the last five or five or so years, right? The this team drafted Dallas Goddard not long ago, and ultimately built him into a role and a player that can, or that ultimately became a wide receiver three and a legitimate one within their offense. And so I can't help looking at Shane Steichen's Colts, thinking 15, 46, 9, 75, and then the Bears get, let's say, 117 or something like that, right? So the idea here, you might hate it, okay? But if we take a look at the Jimmy Johnson chart, this one checks out, is 15 to 9 is not enough to take 46. So you have to do a pick up, pick upgrade from 75 to 46. And then the Bears want to be plus one in their picks. So you could pull back a fourth or something similar. And then at that point, the Bears end up plus one in picks and they get their mid-round first rounder and their second round for a potential receiver. And then at this point, what I think is intriguing, uh, Chicago Fanatic, I actually think they would. The Jets don't have a quality tight end. And so if they don't get a sweet receiver, adding a generational weapon, which is what I think Brock, uh, Brock Bowers can be, it's a strange body type, but he is an exceptional receiving weapon, that that's the kind of guy that the Jets would look at. And they'd also look at probably uh, offensive line. Um, you mentioned, Jordan, that the Chargers will go offensive line. I, I think they will. I also won't be shocked if they trade back. And by that, I mean, I, I'm expecting it at this point. But we'll get there when we get there. The question that I have for the chat here is, would you rather, would you rather trade 75 for a pickup grade or give up the Bears 2025 too? I'm curious. I I like to think my chat is a bunch of pretty smart football fans. I'm going to be honest with you. So are you down to give up the discount, right? Because that's a second round pick. Like this could very likely be pick 55 or maybe pick 50 or something like that. But you could get into pick 55, 60 if the Bears have a particularly successful season. Um, And then you'd keep 75. or would you give up 75 to keep the two? Because either work, we can do either, right? Um, So at this point, let's see, Khalid gives up 75, John gives up the third, uh, at 75, the draft gets a bit thinner. See, I thought I would end up with a split chat here because you're going to have some people that say, ah, screw it, (laughs) like, uh, or like, screw it, give me the extra picks. And you're going to have some people that are going to say, ooh, I want that 2025 offseason to be popping. And then let me see, quick question. So, Reinhardt, are we still in here? If we're not, that's fine. I'll catch you up with next year. Uh, Or I'll catch you up soon. The big question that I have for Ryan Poles, and the one I'm most interested in, I am operating under the assumption that Ryan Poles wants to complete the picture in 2024, right? Where I think what he wants to do is he wants to have the full team experience in 24. He wants to deploy that team and he wants to figure out what works and what doesn't, okay? Do we need more pass rush? Maybe. Or did we have enough? Do we have, do we need more receivers? Do we need more interior help? Do we need more or better play from the tackles? Do we have enough from our tight end? Do we need more in the DB rooms? What's working? What's not, right? Are we going to extend Jaquan Brisker? Are we not? Are we going to extend Kyler Gordon? Are we going to keep Bayless Jones on the roster? All of these questions 
are much more major questions for 2025 because the rare piece of what the Bears can do. Let's get notepad up just to talk about this. And if this is boring, let me know. We'll continue with the draft here in a moment. Uh, the interesting piece about where the Bears have, are is that, so let's draw out the rookie contract, right? Uh, year one, year two, year three, year four, fifth year option, right? And then when we... normally he's not giving up any pick, but it's possible. Or er, so Adrian, it's worth remembering that I think he wants to get into, his, into the second round, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Normally year one is a bust, right? Normally Josh Allen. I don't know. Josh Rosen, Patrick Mahomes, uh, Patrick's a bad example. Um, Trevor Lawrence. Gosh, Bryce Young. I don't know. Um, hey, th thank you so much, Eric. I appreciate you saying that. So normally year one doesn't work, right? And then year two is sort of a figure it out year. And then year three is where you really start pushing for a Super Bowl. The check mark here, by the way, this is me saying that the team is pushing for a Super Bowl. You are actually intending to try to win a Super Bowl. No playoffs. Uh, like, you're not just aiming at the playoffs and calling it good. That's the squiggle, right? You're not just trying to do your best and develop. That's the X, right? The Bears have this unique position where they actually have a chance. They actually have a chance to squiggle in year one and then compete for three full years before the fifth year option. And I really into it <laughs> you tell me if you are but part of me looks at this and says if in year one you can workshop what uh or if, if in year one you can workshop what your team is right and then in year two you are going for it starting immediately i can't help but look at all this draft capital because this is what it is all about why did i go on this rant it's because this draft capital is how you fix the problems. Whatever didn't work, that's the fix. That's how you fix it, right? And so when you start dipping into next year's, you're just taking away a little bit of resources for you to fix whatever didn't work, right? And you're banking on 75 for it. So we'll see. Somebody mentioned earlier, there's no way Poles gives up picks to do this trade. I personally think that Ryan Poles is focused on three draft picks and only three. I think he's focused on Number one, a mid first rounder and a second rounder. And then everything else after that is helpful. He cares. I'm not trying to tell you he doesn't care, just that it's a little less important to him. But we'll get there, right? Uh, for the sake of the argument, let's say that he trades a future two. I wouldn't be surprised if he does a pick upgrade. But for the sake of the argument, we'll do this. And this matches up on the JJ chart pretty well. So then we resume the draft, we flick on down. 9, Quinion Mitchell, 10, Dallas Turner, 11, Brock Bowers, 12, Terion Arnold. Um, yeah, we can, Eric. No worries. Uh, 13, o Olufashanu, 14, Byron Murphy, Robert's mad about it, fuming, putters around the room, acts really upset. We're going to take Jared first, okay? To me, this is where the Bears kind of get boxed in. Khalid, I'm worried about Newton's foot. I don't think he's going to be there. Or, like, I don't think he's going to be on the Bears board. Uh, and Latu Jordan, every doctor I've talked to mentions, uh, that Latu's neck fusion is a way bigger deal than people are making it. That there's very few players that play through that injury, let alone play through that injury on a second contract. So while Latu is a really good edge rusher, I would not be shocked to see verse here. And that's as much me prepping, right? I would love for it to be Murphy. I hope it is Murphy, right? But it didn't get there. And so at this point, I think you take verse. Team gets better. Eat your vegetables. We can moan about it, but the defense at this point has what they need to compete. And then we take a look at this. Um, 
Adrian, when you say, why would he give up 75 for those? Thank you so much, Ryan. I'm so excited that you don't, you don't think it's a good trade. Do you mean because, so when you go from 9 to uh, 15, you don't have a lot of options in terms of if you want to get a second round pick. Uh, let's see. Not that the Bears wouldn't steer away, but you're not worried about his ability to come back. I've talked to a couple doctors that just think differently, Jordan. That doesn't mean they're wrong, right? It, it's more that I, I, I've i talked to some that mentioned that they think that the Jones fracture could cost him a step uh, in the NFL, and it wouldn't surprise me if that may turn them away, right? Yeah, uh, the people I've talked to were worried about it. So at this point, it comes down to whether you want – who got taken where, right? So if I am projecting – now, to be clear, Jordan, they don't think he sucks – or something like that, right? They think it could cost him a little bit in the future. That right now, Jordan, you shoot yourself up with cortisone and you don't worry about it. But as that thing ages, that there's damage on that foot that doesn't change. That's what I was told. You tell me, right? Um, but so then let's take a look here. I don't know where he went. Where did he go at this point? Let's see. Troy Franklin, Lad McConkey. Jalen Polk, Troy Franklin, Keon Coleman, Leggett. Where on earth is Worthy? Am I blind? Did Worthy Worthy got taken to 29? Okay. <laughs> Worthy is like sick. He's like 69th on the PFF board. I, I was like, <laughs> I was sitting here wondering. I was like, I just looked at this. How on earth did he already get taken? Because the Lions took him. If I had to guess, okay, I think that the actual targets here for uh, if the Bears do something like this are worthy. I think they're Lad. I think they're Polk. I don't think they're Franklin. Again, this is just me guessing. Um, I think they like Coleman because he blocks and he's got a lot of things that he can do. I don't think that they love Leggett. And so at this point, it would be a matter of Roma Wilson, Ricky Pearsall. Wouldn't surprise me if they liked Roman here. But even so, uh, I would tell you with a straight face that this is where you're going to get two Eat Your Vegetables picks and you do not live the dream, right? I'll go with Roman. It doesn't really matter. But, uh, or just because I don't know who they'd pick. Javon, or Javon Baker is interesting. I wish he flashed more at the Senior Bowl. Same with Tez Walker. I thought both of these guys had a chance to really assert themselves, but I don't think they did uh i actually thought they fell into the background way too much pierce all really impressed me down there so if he was the answer like i'm cool with that right mcfly guy perfect way of putting it where roman is the safe choice that's going to end up being a solid wide receiver too right but you're definitely not going to delude yourself into thinking that roman's a wide receiver one which is it is what it is, right? Chris Truitt, I don't think the Packers would draft uh, Drake May if he got there. I don't think Drake's going to fall that far, though. That, that'd be an awfully long way. Um, but so then let's see. Yeah, no kidding. Or Reinhardt, the, the Rashi thing is a mess. It wouldn't surprise me if of the two USC receivers, it wouldn't surprise me if the Bears liked Taj more. Call it a gut feel, right? Um, but so... Then as far as like other guys I see just on their board, I imagine they want one of these guys because they're, they're going to be a little more dependable. Not these specifically, but this class of receiver. But when everybody says, hey, don't trade back too far, like here's the complicated part, man. Like just being real, we traded back to 15 and already lost the defender that I wanted to take. Like I think you do not have to agree with me, everybody. I think Byron Murphy is a blue chipper. I think he plays interior defensive line. And if you wanted to call him a red chipper, I'll say, okay, but then we have to redefine what a red chipper is because there's not that many of them, right? Um, I think Murphy's really good. We lost him because we traded a 15. By trading a 15, we pick up a second round pick and only just barely. Like we have to squeeze to get that second round pick in this case. The Bears are not in a rock and a hard place. It's just a little harder in my opinion, to come away with the Santa Claus super Christmas, right? <laughs> than it is on a mock draft simulator. Even then it's getting difficult. Jordan, when I say I think he's a blue chipper, I think he has a blue trait, which matters to me, right? The quickness and the first step that he displays, as well as his ability to penetrate, is I think hard to find, 
right? You mentioned, Jordan, that you've got serious concerns about Murphy's frame and being maxed out. I hear you. I think that the leverage that he shows when he's taking on double teams is really impressive to me. And I think that his hand usage, especially in pass rush situations, can get even better. And the fact that it can get even better leaves me feeling excited about where he can go as a player. But we'll see, right? Uh and I'm with you. You can call him a red chipper. That's totally fine. I, I get it if you wanted to say that he's not on the level of a guy like Romadunze, because you're right. He's not built in the lab perfect, right? Same with Malik neighbors. To call them blue chippers, Murphy's definitely a red chipper. But so I want to back off that take. You're right. But that said, the uh, I also think that he's a really good football player. And I'm very excited to see him. I think he fits really perfectly in this defense, but it's its own problem you got to solve, right? Uh, let's see. At the, at this point, I think I wouldn't surprise me if Jermaine Burton is off their board, just off of the character concerns that uh, a couple people were talking about earlier. I think Neeland is interesting here. If you wanted to go edge at 46, I think if you went edge at 15, Ryan, and then you also went edge at 46, there would be Bears fans that would jump off of roofs, and I would like to save as many lives as possible. So we're definitely going to take a wide receiver, right? If you did reset this thing a little bit, I wonder if the Bears are intrigued by A.D. Mitchell. I don't know, though, right? This is where I have to be Mr. Speculative, and I have to say it sure seems as if there's character, uh, like as if there are character concerns regarding A.D. Mitchell that Robert Schmitz on the internet is never going to get the chance to answer. Maybe in the future when I'm super mega credentialed or whatever, um, I, I can ask guys questions and get a feel for people, but then I worry I'm just going to end up being a hypesman, right? But so anyways, if it was if I wanted instant production, Ricky Pearsall makes a lot of sense. Roman Wilson was really slippery. I think he would fit really well with what Caleb likes to do uh, personally. Michael Hall seems awesome from what I can tell, but I don't know why on earth he's falling like he is because he's falling like a stone. Uh, in a lot of these mocks, but Rothick, that was another one where uh, you mentioned Jacob Cowing. I wanted to love Cowing. How are you doing, uh, Donald? I, I wanted to. I was so there for a guy like Cowing, and I wanted to see him pop at the Senior Bowl. I was ready for it. I was like, this guy's going to explode, and he didn't. Now, did that mean he played like badly? You know? Nah, not really, but he didn't shine, and there were corners there that I think he could have shined against. He just didn't. And so that doesn't mean I'm going to write him off. But when you do get the chance to go see some of these guys in person, I do think it changes your mind pretty quickly about just who they are, et cetera, et cetera. But so let's see here. What do we got on offensive line? Is BB the kind of guy you could take at 75 with a straight face? Because it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, I don't know anything, I'm going to be honest with you, about a guy like Rook. Um, see, I'm going to have to literally like pronounce it to myself. What is that? Or horror. Embarrassing. Or, or, oro. Or, 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 or. There you go. <laughs> and that's the thing, because... I was thinking the same thing, Jordan, where I was looking at this and I was like, BB rules. Like, BB, BB's a great player. I would take BB without any questions. Like, to me, this is a lineman pick, right? Everybody asked earlier, they said, or like, everybody wants to strengthen the offensive line. We're all on the same page. I don't think you need to do it really high. I think you can do it here at 75, et cetera, et cetera. It's <laughs> oh, roar, 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 or, Oro, 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 Oro. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Feels like I'm <laughs> just cracking up over here. But so anyways, I saw me try to take away from Rook. It's more like I look at some of these linemen and I think to myself, if you're going to add the third round is a great spot to train up a developmental guard. Um, and I think BB would be perfect if he's there. I don't think he'll be there. Right. But let's see, you're discounting one or two of those day two picks being traded back five, 10 spots. I'm there with you. Um, I think that makes too much sense right now. Uh, Rothick, I'm trying not to spend too much time in the simulator, to be honest with you, because the other thing like, OK, you tell me what you guys think. The other funny thing about mock drafts is that am I crazy 
am I about to say something that uh, a content creator shouldn't say? I think you can uh, do too much of them, right? Like it, that's the thing. Donald mentions I've run twenty sim or I, I've run twenty sims since Sunday. Like that's the thing. I think that there is almost a a limit to how much we can talk about it. We should talk about it some. It's fun, right? But I also think that there's a balance to this where we can talk about general strategy and we can talk about how good a lot of these players are and we can talk about how excited we are to see the draft because when the whole league drafts, it's a spectacle. Charles, I'm so glad you're enjoying it, by the way. But also, I've seen some people turn draft simulators into this is what they should do, right? And I hope I'm giving you at least hear me say, I'm trying to make this, what do I actually think the Bears are going to do, right? Because what Robert would do and what the Bears are going to do are not always the same. In this case, I think they want the holistic approach instead of just like sell hard for offense, but that's its own question, right? When I look at this spot on the board, if somehow the Bears got here, I think Taj is in question because then you bring in two receivers, which is solid. Uh, JK, that's a good question. Let's talk about this. Um, but so the I would be really interested if they wanted a DB here. I would love to see a safety. Now, they could add like Tavondre Sweat or something like that if they wanted to. I don't know if they're going to, right? But the when I look at this, I think Taiki is a player. I don't know where they're going to have Bo Brady, who I think is criminally underrated, or Keaton Oladapo, who's also criminally underrated, or Cole Bishop, who's also criminally underrated. But you could get any of these guys at 117, and I would go, yes! Right? And then if we add corner, it won't shock me if... Uh, where's my dog? Where's my dude? Jalen Simpson is still on the board. And if Jalen Simpson was on the board, I would also get really excited about him. I think you could draft Cam Smith here. Um, something panicking. That's his name, right? Uh, except he may have already gone. Um, I think Kalen King is almost becoming an interesting um, reclamation project because he's Cam Hart. There he is. Uh, I'll be happy as long as we leave the draft with Caleb, pretty much, right? Uh, and then watching Caleb Carson give Coleman comps is frustrating. Uh, Coleman who? But so I think I think Caleb Carson rules. Uh, if they were going to take him, I still like him. Uh, it doesn't. One thing, Jordan, that you've kind of talked about before is I am unbothered. I, oh, I hear you. I am unbothered when I see other people like take guys that I like and push them down the board because when you like them, you like them. And it's funny to me because while slow tight ends are generally always bad uh, investments, and I hadn't realized that until this last year, that's never going to take away my love for the Purdue cat last year, uh, who, oh my gosh, was Payne Durham, who I think even caught a nice little, uh, or I think even caught a nice little cat or a nice little pass just last year in the NFL. When guys can play, they can play. Right. But so I think a DB would make a lot of sense if the Bears had a trade like this. Right. Oh, man, Jordan. Jarvis Brownlee was awesome in Mobile. He was so good. If the Bears took a guy like him, I would be all about it. One guy or I think Oladapo is really fun. Uh, if you guys want to see him, we can. That's if you guys really want to crunch safety tape at a time like this. <laughs> but so. uh Main thing that you would look at for a couple of these guys, Kitano Ladapo is an older safety, but he's a really, really sudden mover. And he's nice and instinctive in terms of the way he plays. Hard to make a read on whether it is experience because he's played in the system for as long as he has or uh, somebody else. But thank you, Jordan, for saying that because I've been looking at Oladapo and I've been like, why on earth are people underrating him? Uh, let's see, the Austin Booker, Chris Braswell. I think they could be there, uh, Donald. I have no idea what their impact level would be. And in this case, I actually mean I have no idea. But so I have to make a pick, right? I'm going to go with, I mean, I think if he's there, you go with Simpson because I think Simpson looks phenomenal. I don't think he'll be there. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm not going to make too many calls this draft cycle because <coughs> there's a lot of things I don't know. That's one that I feel pretty good about. Like to me, Simpson's tape is just too widely. 
And I think he'll go in the compensatory third. Um, and that's the thing, 4P. You mentioned, do I think I overvalue the senior bowl? Yeah, when I didn't do a ton of uh when I didn't do a ton of research, yes, I definitely overvalue the senior bowl. Cause that's my uh <laughs> that's my like that's the most of the tape I've watched of some of these guys, right? Uh but so I'm gonna draft Simpson because sue it. Uh I don't I don't mind. And then we're gonna take Taj Washington, who on film, Caleb trusts Taj a lot. To me, Taj Washington is your secret receiver that is, um, oh my gosh, what's the kid's name? I'm not going to make, uh, I'm, I'm really not going to make too many calls. You, go, you guys know how we've said a couple times, oh, well, if this person and that person goes down, well, what's everybody going to do, right? Or if uh, if Keenan Allen goes down, what are they going to have? Tyler Scott as their wide receiver three? Well, no. In this case, they'd have Roman Wilson, right? And then you'd also have Taj Washington, who Caleb immediately hits the ground running with some experience with, right? And I tend to think that's actually going to be decently valuable. Like when we talk about Aaron Rodgers stuff, Aaron Rodgers had his Randall Cobb. Knowing where a guy is is half the battle, especially when you're playing against some of these zone defenses that you see around the NFL. That's by no means me trying to say that it's going to work out to the absolute perfect top tier level. I like to be optimistic in streams like this. Don't take me too seriously. Have fun with it, right? But Taj Washington is your chance at a Dontavion Wicks is what I was going for, where it's a late round wide receiver that ends up overperforming in part because of the connection that he's able to build with your quarterback. Do I need to explain the connection with the quarterback? They played together, right? But also Taj is really wily. He is solid against man coverage. He's not amazing, but he's solid top to bottom. He's not huge. He's not especially fast. You're looking at a guy who is, Mooney's a bad comparison, so I'm trying to think of a better one. But it's somebody who's a really good route runner and creates space with his feet, which is good. Uh, and Donald, you mentioned he doesn't do anything for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not expecting him to. I think if he did, he, if he did something for you, he'd probably be higher up in most draft cycles, right? But oh, Charles mentions, what up, y'all? How you doing, Charles? Let's do one more. The piece to this that obviously makes a big difference. All right. Let's talk through this because I think it's interesting. Okay. Number one. Bears pick Caleb Williams. Right. 4P mentions try NFL database. Well, we're going to just mock this together. Okay. I think that. uh, So let's go. Ken P. Let's walk through it. Let's. So, at number two, okay, if it was me, I would take Drake May. I'm going to be very real with you. I think Drake May is still the NFL prototype, right? I think that the idea that people are going to take Jaden Daniels over Drake May is bizarre to me. I really do. But it feels as if the NFL is really prepared for Jaden Daniels to go number two. For at for at least this evening, I'm going to assume they're right. Um, let's see. I I agree with you, Donald. I, I really do. Like we will let's talk through it. But so I'm going to assume they're right because it'll be wild if they aren't. But I'm holding two. I would take Drake. It's not that shocking if they don't take Drake <laughs> or if, if Washington takes Drake, but. We'll see, right? So next up, number three. Right now, I think the Giants trade up here. And I think that they would trade up for Drake. Now, New England may take Drake May. I could understand New England taking Drake May. But I'm going to assume that the Patriots get exactly the pick that they want, right? They get six, they get 47, they get a round two for number three. And I think that they would appreciate this because the Patriots get a little bit of the best of both worlds here. When they move back to six, they still get a sick receiver or a lineman, right? But they also get a litany of other picks to add. The So Jordan, I don't know anything. I've tried to get what I can. It seems as if the Giants love McCarthy and that they are going to 
they are going to do what they can to make that happen. In this case, I think they would take Drake, like if they can, but maybe they take McCarthy. I'm going to have them take Drake here because I think Drake can play immediately and that that's not a worry. I think New England doesn't want a quarterback right now. I don't know if they could pull that off with Robert Kraft. I may be wrong. I'm ready to be wrong, right? But I also think that the that the Giants basically want it more and that the Patriots know that they're a ways out from being able to draft a quarterback. The the Patriots are I mean what do you guys think? I think they're probably about where the 2022 Bears were. Like that roster's a mess. They are bad. And if they draft a rookie quarterback, their best case scenario is that they are finally patched up by his third year. And I just don't know if the Patriots organization thinks that that's prudent. Anyways, the Giants come up to three. They didn't come up for Marv. They came up for Drake. Um, but so, uh, what should you expect from John Boy coverage if McCarthy goes there? Watch Talking Giants. Those guys are great. A lot of Giants coverage is messy, but that's that's the world, right? Then at number four, here's my hot take, okay? Poll for the room. Is Minnesota coming up to four? They could, right? Uh, based on what I've seen, the or from a trade chart perspective, if Atlanta or if um, here's what I think. Okay, talking this out. I don't think Minnesota wants to go to four if they don't have to, right? I think Minnesota wants a quarterback, but I think that the Chargers want to sell, and I think the Vikings want to go to the lowest possible seller that they have to go to. I mean, nobody wants to trade any higher than they have to, right? And so it won't shock me, Rothick, you're stealing the words out of my mouth, if the if the Cardinals end up kind of boxed into taking Marvin Harrison, which is totally fine, by the way. Like, here's the funny part of Kusai. You mentioned there's no way the draft starts with four quarterbacks. Not only do I agree with you, but Monty Austinfort is going to have zero issues defending the Marvin Harrison pick, right? Like, oh, oh, I took Marvin Harrison Jr.? Yeah. We went with the best guy on our board. Easy press thing to say. And Arizona's going to go nuts over a comment like that because that's what people do, right? They run with whatever comment. You're going to have number two, Jaden Daniels. Washington's going to say, we had him higher than Caleb all along. And then number three, Drake May. New York is going to come out and say, we can't believe Washington didn't take him. This guy's our QB1. Like, we, we've seen this. Well, t- Brandon, you showed up at the right time. I will. Th- then you've got Monty Awesomefort, and you guys already saw it, didn't you? Did we see the Breer quote that Monty Awesomefort, who always moves up and down the draft, is thinking he might pick it four? I think it's because they want to move down and they don't want to sell at a loss, right? And so if the Giants have already moved up, I think they just get boxed out personally. And so then they take Marvin Harrison, draft moves on. Then we get to five. I think the Chargers want to get to get out of here. So let's take a look. The Vikings want the Vikings want to come up. What is it? Eleven and twenty three for five. And let me see. Jimmy Johnson chart. Twenty three and eleven coming up to five. That's a small premium. You probably have to throw in a future first while you're at it. It will not be accepted. Why wouldn't it be accepted? What am I missing here? What did I do wrong? <laughs> oh, man. D- that would be wild. Uh, let's see here. Did it get the trade backwards? I think it did. Let's see. How funny. Okay. Uh, the Chargers need to add something. I got it. I got it. I got it. Okay, so let's see. I'm going to force it. We're going to call it QB tax. It doesn't matter for the purpose of this exercise. We're only going to the Bears. Uh, but so I think they come up. And then it wouldn't surprise me if they take, I mean, obviously if they came up like this, they're going to take McCarthy. But McCarthy falling would not shock me. Not because I'm hating on your guy, Jordan but because I think McCarthy is getting to a point where I like JJ. I've talked 
many times about how I like JJ. I think he can become a really solid player in this league. Very solid player. You are getting to the point where you have to give up an awful lot to get JJ McCarthy. And I think it becomes a scarier prospect than, than it should. Because JJ is not ready to start yet. And you're starting to get to a place where you have to play him immediately. And I think there's a problem there. I mean, I don't know if JJ is fully ready for that kind of thing. Thank you, Jordan. I appreciate you saying that because I agree with you. The point where we've now made Jaden Daniels the second overall pick, even if he's top 10, and JJ also top 10, that is a heck of a quarterback inflation. And that's all right. Doesn't mean we hate him, right? Um, it just means the other piece to this is that just like Arathic said, the Vikings situation is not super kind to them, draft capital-wise. But we're back to six, and it would not shock me if the Patriots take anything. Like, you could convince me that the Patriots want alt, uh, or and they're not going to take alt. I think they're okay at tackle. Um, but they'll take neighbors. I- I'd be surprised if they didn't take neighbors. Maybe he's, maybe Rome, as far as a character guy, is the kind of guy they want to build a locker room around. But to me, neighbors is an offense at a bottle. Like, at least when I look at the or what Malik neighbors brings your offense. It's that any, so think about it this way, right? We talked about this earlier, but for anybody who's just joining recently, I'll recap it with Marvin Harrison. You need a quarterback. That's going to be able to throw him the ball with Malik neighbors. You just need to dump the ball to him and he'll make it work. Let's see. Why am I so low on Jaden? Is it the lack of midfield throws Four P it's mostly because I'm becoming a believer in a quarterback's career, defining them more than their latest season, right? That's not just me trying to prop up Caleb or something, right? It's more like I can't help but look at Jaden Daniels at Arizona State and see that Arizona State, through the first year or two of uh, LSU, we had one player that looked a certain way. Then he gets Malik Neighbors and also... uh Brian Thomas Jr., and suddenly he has a Heisman season in which he looks amazing, right? And that's by no means me trying to say that the, that's not me trying to say that he sucks or something. It's more to say that I think Jaden Daniels is your normal quarterback. This is the best way I put it, man. Like, because what you mentioned, Donald, Jaden Daniels' elite year is a function of his elite two receivers, see Justin Fields. I get all the Fields concerns. Fields is still a prospect that I would have drafted. Like, I'm not upset that the Bears drafted him. If that makes sense. The fact that somebody's going to draft Jaden Daniels doesn't bother me. The fact that Jaden Daniels is a normal quarterback prospect. The fact that there are two of Caleb Williams and Drake May is the unusual part. The issue here is that I do think that Jaden has a bunch of flags that indicate that he could have trouble in the NFL game. Not just the middle of the field thing. Not just the fact that he basically has one of the shortest average depth of completions of a quarterback that's going to be drafted at his caliber, but it's mostly his vicious hits that he takes. The guy has very little ability to, or like he doesn't protect himself much, which I find pretty ridiculous. So for the sake of the argument, this could be any lineman. Okay. This doesn't, it doesn't have to be alt. I'm going to use alt as a placeholder because I do think the tack or that the Titans won offensive line. And then I think eight, um, how you doing? Uh, Philemon excited to see you. I think that at eight things get really interesting because I don't think the Falcons want a Dunze. I do think that all kinds of other teams might, they've got the bills here because the bills are a really popular trade back. I don't think that would happen. I think Jacksonville is really intriguing. You guys tell me if I'm nuts, I'm going to ask you a really direct question. How close do you think Jaden Daniel or no, how close do you think Trevor Lawrence is to not signing an extension in Jacksonville? What do you think has to change for Trevor Lawrence to sign an extension in Jacksonville? Is it just that he has to get offered? Is it that easy? Right? Because I think if Trevor Lawrence hit the market, he would get paid, 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 paid. Right? I can't help but look at Jacksonville and think that this is a team that needs to come up and go get a receiver because if they don't 
they could easily piss Lawrence off. And Donald, you're right. Almost all quarterbacks get resigned. Because why wouldn't they? They get offered stupid money. They'd be stupid not to take it. But it doesn't help anything, Donald, that Trevor Lawrence right now is suffering injury. And also he just lost his sweet receiver. Like, it's it, he just lost Calvin Ridley. Now they're back down to uh, to just Christian Kirk, right? So I can't help thinking that while they may try to sell him on A.D. Mitchell, who could be sweet, or Brian Thomas Jr., who could be sweet, it wouldn't surprise me to see Jacksonville try to come up, okay? So because of this, and McFly guy, that's a good point, that he'd get tagged both seasons if he didn't take the deal. So if you're going to wait out two tags, that's an awfully long time. So he may end up getting boxed in. What I'm ultimately trying to get at here, if the Bears want a Dunze, I think they might have to come up to nine. And I'm really curious to know if Atlanta would let him. Is Atlanta down to go back to nine and take Turner? Or do they want to go back a little further, right? And uh, Chicago, you mentioned, what if they are content waiting? Who's they? Uh, Atlanta? Like, or, or or somebody else. Oh, you mean you mean Lawrence? Maybe it just gets tough because the moment you blot your knee on one of the tag seasons, you're never seeing that money. So from a safety perspective, you have to take the extension. Chicago, uh, Chicago fanatic. This is a, the same token of what I talked about for a long time with the Jalen Johnson deal that you tag Jalen, and the moment you tag Jalen, signing the extension that he was already offered becomes a $25 million guaranteed money bump, right? You're guaranteed 18 to $20 million until you sign that extension, at which point you get 45. Because you tagged him, he's out of leverage. Now he has to play the whole season. He's not going to do that. And he signs a steal. And then everybody claps, right? Andre, thank you so much. I got you. No worries. Um, thank you so much for checking it out. Uh, if nothing else, I hope I give you some stuff to chew on, even when you don't agree, right? Uh, but so, it, just because I think it's funny. Anyways, so at number eight, I'm really interested to see what happens here. I don't know the answer. If I had to guess, I think they want Dallas Turner. Um, but then another option that they may want is, I could see them wanting Byron Murphy. That's not out of the question. I think they want a defender, like a defensive lineman specifically, right? But we'll see. I, I'm down for whatever you guys want to do. I don't think that the Bears get this so easily. And it's part of why I think that if anybody wants Roma Dunze, this is their chance to go get him, right? So maybe that's the Jets. Maybe that's the Broncos. I doubt it'd be the Broncos, just because I don't know if the Broncos have the ammo. I, maybe it's the Saints. Maybe it's the Colts. Like a lot of these teams that we want to trade with the Bears, I could understand them wanting to go to eight, right? And Chicago Fanatic, you mentioned what if Tennessee becomes a trade partner for wide receiver. That's totally possible, right? But it won't surprise me because Khalid mentions, I do think we're going to use Odunze for bait. I don't think we're the only ones, and by we, I mean polls, with the idea, right? <laughs> and Donald, I'm intrigued to see that. The main thing I look at is that this top three receiver set with, um, oh my gosh, the top three receivers, MHJ, Neighbors, Adunze, are in a little tier of their own. And then the next set of receivers is a step down from there. Doesn't automatically make them bad. This is receiver in the NFL. It happens all the time, right? It's just not those guys. These guys are plug and play wide receiver ones, or at least they're going to be built that way. And that kind of stuff sells season tickets. That kind of stuff helps locker rooms. That kind of stuff gives offensive coordinators guys to game plan around it does a lot for your organization. It's the reason I was so high on the Bears getting DJ Moore last year. And they did. But uh, we'll see. So it won't surprise me at all. Uh, JK, I really don't have any thoughts on uh, MHJ only taking two visits. I, I really don't. <laughs> like, I would tell you if I did. I think everybody who's want to, or I, you got to remember that all these teams meet with all these players at the Combine. Like, anybody at the Combine meets with the player. But we'll see. Anyways, so for the sake of the argument, I don't know. What the Rams take? It's three he visited the Giants. I gotcha. Um, 
I just don't want to make this too easy for the Bears. Because here's the other problem, right? Like, y'all, the, uh, the... I want to mention is if the Bears end up with... So, Joe. Joe mentions the Bills trade up with Atlanta. I'll abandon my point for a brief moment. Uh, Joe, I don't think it's going to happen. It's possible, right? Um, but I, I don't think it is. Or I don't think it's going to happen. I think the Bills are going to have an eat your vegetables season. And then in 2025, they're going to reload, re-rack for a second championship window. I think you've got to pay your debts. And the good news in the NFL is you can pay them all at once, right? The bad news is, is that obviously that comes at a cost. And in this case, it's going to be a weird season to do it because that might signal the end of the Sean McDermott era if things don't go well. So who knows? Maybe I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth. And as I circle around this point, I get to the point where I think, is this coaching staff really going to just lie down and die, right? Or are they going to, are they going to advocate to trade up? I don't know. But it doesn't feel to me like the bills are desperate. I think they traded Diggs on purpose. Let's put it that way. And because of that, I think they're aware of where they are. They just cut some of their major free agents. They had like a large scale purge. They, I think they know what this is. And so I just don't think they're coming up. It would be cool, but I don't think they're coming up. <laughs> Phil, I don't think so. But so the Bills could, eat, or I think the Jets could come up. The Jets are an interesting one. Uh, and in this case, I actually might just force it let's see my teams lol the jets i like the idea of the jets coming up what would that cost let's see are people talking about the bills <laughs> again I'm not going to really think too hard about the trade package here unless it's the Bears because it doesn't matter to me. Um, so I'm forcing this trade because I think the Jets jumping the Bears to take Rome Dunze makes sense. Then you add Rome to Garrett Wilson for a brief moment. Can we think about how cool that would be? Like if Aaron Rodgers has anything left in that tank and you got Rome Dunze and also Garrett Wilson on that same like Jets team, whoo! That is a solid duo right there. The body types blend really well together. But most importantly, I think the longer I sit with this, right? And who knows? Maybe they come up for line uh, because we haven't picked any linemen. And I think a lot of these linemen are going to just fly off the board. I just can't get a feel for where, right? Like, that's the other problem with this. I just get, I won't be shocked, okay? Scrolling all the way up. If a board like this is what's gone, right? Where you've got no receivers, you don't have Joe Alt or whoever your OT1 is, and then you have everybody else, right? Donald mentions, why don't you pivot and take Dallas Turner, the player Atlanta wants? So I'm curious to hear what you guys think. Dallas Turner worries me. Turner is exceptionally talented, and in February, he's exactly the kind of guy I'm going to tell you is exceptionally talented. Is anybody else worried that he's exactly the kind of player that you were going to tell yourself, just wait, in three years, you're really going to see it. And then you wait three years, and you never really see it, right? Leonard Floyd, who I know um, I know, Brandon's going to jump on me for this, but it's like Leonard Floyd is the kind of player I think of, where he ends up a good player, perfectly good player, but never an ultra star, Right? And he's the kind of guy that people are going to feel like is they're going to talk about him as if he's about to be an ultra star and he may never become one. And that's okay. It's just, is that worth it over some of these other guys? Like Leonard Floyd is a hell of a player, Donald. So, so is your adverse, right? Where it's like, these guys can be eight to 10 sack guys. Nothing wrong with that. I just think, okay, so my hot sports opinion, Okay, is if everybody in this class hit their ceiling, and I'm curious to hear what everybody thinks about this. This may be one of the hottest takes I've ever had on the show. Okay, so just take a breath. All right, I'm saying this on a. You know what? No, I'm not going to couch it. I'm just going to come out and say, if all of the defenders hit their ceiling, um, 
their realistic ceiling. I still think Latu's career is too short. I think Verse is a, is a good player, maybe even a player that gets talked about a lot, but I don't ever know if he cracks the top 10 with edge rushers because edge rusher is hard. I think Dallas Turner ends up being a slightly better Leonard Floyd, which is a hell of a player. None of these guys are Hall of Famers, but I think Byron Murphy could be. My big hot take here is that if Byron Murphy hit his ceiling ceiling, he will be a mess to block. You may disagree because he may be too short. You may think there's no way, right? But I can't, wa- I can't help but watch his tape and think to myself, this guy as a penetrator could be unbelievable, right? And Khalid mentions, why haven't we invited him for a 30? It could be all kinds of things. I mean, they may feel as if they've already got all the information they need on somebody like Byron Murphy. They could talk to his coaches and not feel as if they're missing any information. Maybe they talked to him at the combine, they got everything they needed. But we'll see. Um, I, I couldn't tell you. I just can't help watching his tape and thinking, oh man, this guy's a beast. Uh, but so, the, that's the thing, Arafik. Like, when I, when I think about the players in this draft, one of them is creating interior pressure at an unbelievable rate. And interior pressure is so hard for an offense to... Brandon, you got to text me your Dallas Turner eval. Uh, but so, the... Uh, or what is this? Um, let me see. Interior pressure is a mess. Uh, I lost my point, which is okay. Uh, Joe, I'm with you. Maybe they do really like Dexter. I don't think Dexter is ever going to stop you from drafting a guy you think might be the best defender to class. And that's all this would be, right? Not dissimilar, I guess, from the Jalen Carter trade, but it's own different thing. Um, JMS, I'm glad to hear it's not that hot. To me, the hardest part about hot takes is that if it's too hot, you're probably just wrong right? Like the hottest takes come from having no backing whatsoever. So if it isn't that hot, that means that it has some grounding to it. Maybe. I I know we're talking ceiling and ceiling's messy, but I can't help, or I can't get my mind off of Murphy when it comes to what he could be at at nine here. If the Bears ended up boxed in to this pick and they felt as if they had to take Murphy, I won't cry about it. But I think they're going to try to trade down. Uh, uh, We talked earlier about what that trade down could be. Um, Maybe for all we know, they like A.D. Mitchell. They like Brian Thomas Jr. It's possible. Another option here would be that uh, that they may take, uh, they could take Fautanu or they could take Fashanu. I mean, if you wanted to take sweet tackles, they're sweet tackles. The only reason they're further down the board is because they are just in the wrong class. Like, it's a good class up at the top. At least it feels that way. But then again, the draft I've studied the most was something that Mel Kuyper immediately came out here and said, or came out and said, this is a bad draft. So that was the 2023 draft. And we all love that. Uh, Brock Bowers is so interesting to me, Donald. He's an unbelievable tight end. I, I really won't say a bad word about him, Donald. Like the part to me about, the part to me that's funniest about Brock Bowers is that I've never seen a tight end assert himself in games the way that he did. Here, here, let me pull it up for you, right? When you, uh, when you watch Brock Bowers, what I keep thinking about is that, let me see, is he on my Simpson tape? I think he is. Starting around the fourth quarter, Brock Bowers, number 19, just took over the game. I mean, like, you can even see it on this rep. Look at this movement from a 200 and, what is he, 240-pound person? Like, come on. That's sweet. You're doing that to linebackers? That's disgusting. He didn't even catch the ball there. But he asserts himself throughout this fourth quarter in a way that I just don't see tight ends do. And I want to flick through the tape a little bit and make sure you've seen it. Because this Auburn game in particular was like, okay, that's nasty. And then especially when you consider the fact that Shane Waldron does use his tight ends pretty creatively, maybe the Bears want that or would take a guy like that 
and find ways to use him as a weapon. I don't know. They paid a lot of money to Cole Komet. They brought in Gerald Everett. They're not going to let Gerald Everett stop them from taking a sweet tight end. But when you look back at tight ends throughout draft history so far, the biggest problem we see is that I, I believe it's um, over the last like 15. Um, when you look at over the last 15 or so first round tight ends, I believe between all of them, you have one, maybe two thousand yard seasons. Does that matter? You don't have to care, right? I'm not about to tell you that you have to care, but it's bizarre how commonly we want to say, yeah, 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 I know, don't draft tight ends in the first round, but this guy's different. We do this all the time, and then Jeremy Shockey's just okay, right? And OJ Howard is just all right, and all this kind of, uh, and that's not to say that I think Powers is bad. Have I said enough good words about Powers yet? Because when I watch movement like this, I'm like, okay, man, you are nasty. We get it. That's a cut that some of these receivers aren't making. Like his own, uh, what is it? Uh, I can't remember this guy's name. Marquise Jackson, something like that. Uh, it's Jackson or Rosemary Jackson. Like this kind of pop is really smooth. Gets up the seam and just pops right on out. <laughs> So, so pretty with his hands, too. Like, natural hands catcher. He's got every trait you would want as a receiver. And also, he's a way better blocker than I think his size shows. Brock Bowers slaps. He is just playing a position that, in my opinion, makes him a really complicated bet. If the Bears take him, I assume Shane Waldron was very adamant he would use him well. And you know what? I'm here for it. Like, here's the best way I could put this, right? Because watch this. I mean, come on. Look. Like, not only are we split out wide, but like, look at that dig route. And we're so open. And we're breaking tackles. Like, we're yards after catching it a little bit. Like, don't let me freak out too hard. This is a tight end, not a receiver. But he's moving with all of the burst of a receiver. The way I see it. I don't think it's going to happen. I'm not going to sit here and advocate for it to happen. If it happens, I will assume they have a plan for him and be down with it. Does that make sense? Like, it's almost like more complicated than just saying draft Brock Bowers, which is what a lot of people will do. Because I think another thing that part of my role is to analyze what I see and part of it is to try to help everybody process what I think these guys are doing behind closed doors to help make sense of stuff that often doesn't make sense, right? Like, why are they tearing down around Justin Fields in 2022? Oh, well, when you look at the cap space, blah, 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 blah. Why'd they trade Khalil Mack, even though Justin Fields is in his second year? Well, when you take a look at their draft capital and just the state of the roster and how rarely guys at 32 succeed, blah, 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 blah. This is my job, right? even though it's a hobby. I think you guys get it. The point is, is that with Bowers, it is rare to be this good as a tight end. It is hard to use a tight end like you use a receiver. It just doesn't really happen a lot. And a lot of the guys that have tried recently have not succeeded. Kyle Pitts is a funny one. He's not even been that bad. He's just not been number four overall. So people, I think, are going to be a little slower on the draw because that's what we do. We overreact to when something goes wrong, we'll now never, never do it again. When something goes right, oh, we'll do it all the time, right? And so it won't surprise me if, to Donald's point, between number 9-ish and number 13-ish, I think Brock Bowers goes somewhere in there. I just don't know where. Maybe he even falls to 15 just because there's not a place for him that wouldn't be D-line and O-line, right? But... I can't help looking at Bowers and think if the Bears take him, the conviction they would need to do it would pretty much make the pick totally worth it. Jeremy K says, if he's Kelsey, is he worth the number nine pick? Jeremy, I'm not being rude. Do you know what you just said? 
<laughs> because Jeremy, if we take a look at Tony Gonzalez, clear Hall of Famer, right? Clear Hall of Famer. Tony Gonzalez. How many thousand yard seasons did Tony Gonzalez have? One, two, three, four. Four thousand yard seasons. A lot of nine hard, a lot of nine hundred yard seasons. A lot of eight hundred yard seasons. Four thousand yard seasons. Considered the best receiving tight end ever. Don't forget that. Then we look at Travis Kelsey. And first of all, let's notice. Gonzalez played from 97 to 2013, right? And between 2013 and 2023, Kelsey has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, uh, or 7, thousand yard seasons consecutively we're talking and i completely hear you donald or, or like derek i completely hear you it's more that we are struggling under the weight of travis kelsey not being the greatest tight end ever so if he's if brock bowers is kelsey yeah it's totally worth pick number nine <laughs> the question that i would ask you is if brock bowers is evan ingram is he worth pick number nine right because Evan Ingram, when it comes to stats, isn't so bad either. Despite the fact that people seem to hate him. Uh, but that's its own separate question. I would say we would probably consider this pretty disappointing, right? If he popped to the 700-yard season, never really reached it again, popped it again, came back to a thousand, like, et cetera. Arothic, I hear you. It, I think Gronk is another, let's, let me take a look there. Gronk stats, stats are, stats are just part of the picture. If you wanted to say Gronk is the best tight end ever, I'm never going to fight you on it. Okay. Cause he and Kelsey play slightly different. So no problem there. Gronk had one, two, three, 4,000 yard seasons. In his case, he ends up with 621 receptions to Travis's unbelievable 900 receptions. Oh, my word. <laughs> Again, this is, this is crazy to me. Like, Rob Gronkowski, 620 run receptions. Uh, whereas Travis Kelsey has almost 150% of that. Gronk ends up with 960 targets. Uh, Kelsey ends up with 1267. And that's the thing, Jeremy, like by no means am I trying to say, I, I hope we're on the same page here. It's more that when you say, oh, okay, let me put it this way, Jeremy. If we're going to talk about like, what ifs, you start to get to this dangerous place where you go, well, Dallas Turner, what if he's Will Anderson? He's probably not Will Anderson. Byron Murphy, what if he's Aaron Donald? He's probably not Aaron Donald. Caleb Williams. What if he's Aaron Rodgers? He is Aaron Rodgers. Got it. That's it. That one's fine. That one we're cool with. Like, Caleb is going to be Aaron Rodgers. Just, like, hopefully not the crazy kooky stuff. But the the on-field football play? Oh, give me some of that. Like, the, uh, but so, anyways, jokes aside, I, I can't help but look at a lot of these comps and just, we got to use a not Hall of Famer in so often as we're able, which gets hard with some of these other guys. Uh, because, let me see. No, I, d I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> but the fact that Gronk is like 30-some-odd? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? But so, uh, let's see, Spencer Rattler. What if he's Tom Spencer Rattler Brady? Yeah, exactly, right? Um, and j -Mass, exactly. Like, that's why if you said Gronk is a wide tight end, and Kelsey is a U tight end, and you factor them differently, go for it, right? No problem with that. The game has changed a ton. It will continue to change. Like, it's, it's a fun game. It's a beautiful game. It's a game that's constantly evolving. Here, let me back this up a little bit so we can see if we can catch more Brock in the fourth quarter because I think I actually shaved it a little too fast. 
Here's more Brock getting open. Look at how smooth this is. Like, look at the burst he has after the catch. We are so accustomed to watching a tight end lumber. You see him over the middle there? Do I need to draw it? Like, zoop. Like, this move, or this footwork right here, to get through, tuck in, it's actually nothing crazy. I, I, could, I could overrate it if I wanted to. It just feels consistent that Bowers can pop into space Clean, efficient movement to get outside of 13, not get jammed. <coughs> Clean catch, and he's gone. I'm, I'm really interesting. think Pitts will prove to have been worth it. Uh, to be honest with you, Phil, no. But I also believe... Okay, so, Phil, here's the other problem, right? This is my opinion. Uh, the hardest part about the Pitts pick was that he got picked at number four, right? I would tell you that pick number nine and pick number four are really different. I still couldn't believe, looking back, that the Lions picked Jeff Okuda when they picked Jeff Okuda because there had to be a trade-up offer. There's, I would be surprised if they were stuck. If they were truly stuck, that's too bad for them, right? But when you pick a guy in the top five, like that's an edge rusher quarterback pick. Or maybe in this case, it's a superstar wide receiver. And I get that. But... It's a generational player, or it is an edge pick, or it is a quarterback in almost all cases, right? But Pitts was just, I don't know. I would talk like I'm some scholar, but I couldn't help but think that it's the draft slot that's really killing Pitts because he's not been that bad. But for, for a tight end, sets you up for failure in the same way that Phil... I think that there are some hardcore draft picks in a couple of years that are going to push their glasses up uh, against their eyes, and they're going to say, Saquon Barkley was a bad pick. And, I mean, depends. It, that's number two overall for a running back. That's going to be pretty hard to pay off. Saquon was amazing. He literally was the franchise for years in New York. So. I don't know. There's value to that kind of thing, and I get it. But you look back at that and you say, whoa, that is that is really, really high for almost any position player, right? Um, but so let me see. Somebody asked me earlier, McFly, does a commit extension make Bowers less likely? A lot of capital and tight end. Honestly, McFly, I think that they would have to view Bowers as a weapon, right? Like, that's by no means me trying to pretend that I'm being, I don't know, corny, right? You would draft Bowers and you would probably give him the tight end designation and you would use him like a really, 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 really shot up uh, Kyle Juszczyk. That is probably not a fair example because I'm not even trying to say he's an H-back, right? I'm trying to say, if I had to guess, you would be using Bowers as a receiver in 11 personnel as a tight end in 13 personnel, occasionally as a halfback in uh, what 21 personnel. I think that you would occasionally use him as one of the receivers in 12 personnel and you'd give Keenan uh, some time off. I almost wonder if you would, uh, how bad would it go if you deployed Bowers as your slot receiver, as your X receiver on like a slant, especially in end zone settings, you would have to want to do all of this is what I'm saying. Like, that's not me saying um, McFly guy that I think you would or that you have to, or uh, that's not me saying you would or that the team that drafts Bowers is going to. It's me saying if the bears were to draft him, you have to have this vision. Don't you agree? Like, if you are going to use him 40% of the time, there's no sense spending the pick on him. No sense. You have to think he's this dude. If you don't, you're not going to do it. Bowers is interesting because you could argue, I, I wonder how badly he'd even play extra here. Like, he's, <laughs> guy's taking, <laughs> he's, he's taking jet sweeps for crying out loud. And that's the thing, Rab. Like, we've hit this point where... So the other thing, Rab, that I think is really interesting. All right, so uh, for a brief moment, I'm going to go to a place where I don't know if we were going to... Uh, you were expecting to think about this. But, like, do we have people in the chat that are relatively young? I'm 
almost 30. I'm 29, okay? And there was this point when I realized that women couldn't apply for a credit card, hang with me, until like 1970, right? Uh, I think it was 1970. May have to go look that up. But the point is, you hit this state of living where you look back and you realize a lot of the things that you took for granted are actually pretty new, right? And for anybody who is relatively young, the older folks in here will remember, we've only gotten hip to this whole draft value thing pretty recently. Like Mel Kuyper was considered a wild man for an awfully long time when he cared as much as he did about the draft. Um, and then moving on, we've hit this point now where a top five pick is gold, but it didn't used to be. I mean, we're not that far removed from not even Ditka's trade for Ricky Williams. I mean, we're not we're not that far removed from some ridiculous trades that have happened recently. It's just that the last 15 years have taught us that draft picks ma matter, even though a lot of the people still in the league didn't think that way for a long time. And you could tell because they still drafted, y'all, Leonard Fournette. Wasn't he picked at four? Like, you mentioned Rab talking about uh, Reggie Bush and Zeke. Like, Leonard Fournette was picked top 10, wasn't he? Like, it's, it's ridiculous when you look back at positional value and the way that we've treated a lot of this stuff for a long time. But it, it really happened. And so it's been funny just watching the league evolve where we've hit the point where now we look back at Saquon and we say, why would anybody do that? But it used to be kind of normal. That's the thing. Jordan mentions, I mean, Leonard was a special prospect. That's my point, Jordan. Like, it used to be normal because it made sense because they were special. Like, they, and then it changed. Now it doesn't work that way. And it's never, it might never again. And so, We'll see how things change. I don't know how they're going to change, but it's funny watching the league evolve because at least the way it's turning right now, I think kind of favors a good amount. Oh, man. Oh, man. Did he come down with this? No. Carson's kind of firing in this game. I'm just saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. You want to talk about dominating? Y'all, we've just been watching Bowers in the fourth quarter. You've seen him catch for almost 100 yards. Look at that. Snap in. Yeah, okay, I got you. <laughs> I mean, I love watching great players make great plays, and I get that. But, like, how about it? Five does a great job. This is really, really, really good coverage from number five. And Bauer says, yeah, okay. <laughs> if you say so, pal. <laughs> and just collects that thing. Oh, man. Oh, and not to be outdone, Donald. <laughs> Donald, as if that wasn't enough. <laughs> you can't make this up. You're telling, I, I will tell you what, you watch some of this stuff and you go, sheesh, you put the, you give this guy to Caleb Williams, like, <laughs> he's going to be okay. Caleb's going to be all right. Look at this. You break this thing down, and it is it is just stupid. He thumbs it. <laughs> Look at how small the football looks in his hand. That is a mitt. Looks like he's playing with a kid's toy. How on earth does he catch that? Did they call it incomplete? Maybe they said, that's unlawful. That's just not going to work here.
No kidding, Ryan, right? And then here's where we picked up. But all this to say, like, now you get to see that this sun run by Bowers is just nutty. I want to watch the yak one again. Because I think the yak one is just dirty. Like, obviously, it's clear he's good. And you know he's good. And you're seeing him do just sicko things left and right. But, oh my gosh. His ability to create yards after catch is, I think, what really surprises me. No, Martin, it doesn't, does it? That catch is just bananas. In and out of his break so easy. If Dalton Kincaid can translate, I'm not worried about Bowers translating. It's just a question of whether he's going to get used well enough. Like, separating through this defense on this kind of a play, to me, is so filthy. I'd be furious if I was an Auburn fan. Bowers just decided that the game was over over the course of this Auburn fourth quarter. This to me is like peak Brock Bowers. Man, the footwork in this is so fun too. Like look at this hip drop right here. It's one huge right foot and I understand it doesn't matter, but it looks not only is he decelerating so that he can get inside, but it visually looks like he could easily be planting to get back out into the corner, like with some kind of stop and go or stop and seam. And so you just end up creating a ton of separation. And then see you later. Dog. I just have no idea if you can draft him. I, I don't know. I'll be down if they do. He really did, Ryan. I mean, he really did. Uh, let me see. Honestly, yeah. All right, so a couple of my streams recently got blocked. Uh, I'm not worried about it because screw the police. Uh, I don't care, to be honest with you. I'm going to put more stuff out later on this game because I've just been slow to get football content out, and I'm not going to worry about it because I refuse to put that kind of – negative energy in my life, but we can talk through a little bit of the uh, Caleb game against Colorado. One thing I do think is funny, by the way, okay? I'm just throwing this out there. And I understand that anybody who's watching the stream right now likes me. And so if you, uh, I, I, they're getting blocked Donald because I show College Ultimate 2. Life on YouTube, right? Um, but so one thing I think is funny, right, is I hear all kinds of comments when I watch games like this about how, oh, well, the, uh, <laughs> love it, doctor. I hear all kinds of comments about how, oh, well, Colorado's defense is bad, right? And what I think is funny is that uh, when I watch quarterbacks, generally when they play a bad defense, it's more an indictment on what they allow from the guys across from them, right? Like the, the so let me put it this way, okay? The quarterback's job is harder against Notre Dame. You know what? I'm going to prove it. We're, we're, we'll watch a couple plays of this. We'll watch a couple plays of the Notre Dame game, and you'll get what I mean. The only real difference between bad defense, good defense, as far as the quarterback goes, is how often is your play going to even work, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not upset about this. I mean, the like when your play works and you execute it well, that's bad. No, it's not. It's it's only bad in Caleb's case because all kinds of people got like cold feet about whether or not Caleb was going to be able to play in structure. You know he can, right? It was never a question of can he. It's a question of will he and will he always. Like, And those are different questions. But what's funny to me about Colorado in particular is there's a lot of moments where Colorado decided that there was no way they were going to be able to cover everybody. And so they're, this is a wrong example here, but they're just going to blitz the piss out of Caleb, right? And when they go to blitz the piss out of Caleb, Caleb, by and large, was not bothered by it. And I love that. I don't know how you wouldn't. 
Like as a Bears fan, watching a quarterback with the poise to see the blitz and throw through the blitz is so much fun. I mean, when you watch Notre Dame, they just weren't able to run screens like this and pick up 10 yards. That's the difference. It didn't mean that Caleb didn't show his quarterbacking acumen throughout this game. And by the way, if you really need me to draw up concepts, I can, right? But the, oh, I mean, Jordan, the, the interception comes from him thinking he's a straight up God. What, what is funny about the air raid just within this is that I, so I don't know the air raid super well. But based on what I see on film, okay, the air raid is basically a collection of pick a concepts, right? And I would say pick a side, except I don't think it's organized that way. I think this play is organized in these thirds, right? Like, for instance, you've got a slot fade right here. You've got a curl underneath the slot fade. So if we're playing too high, or if we're playing man defense, we can work the slot fade, right? But if they're off, just like you see right here, in off coverage, we can work the curl. Or if this concept isn't there, we can work this curl out here. Or if that concept's not there, we can work a big curl with a flat route over here. But Caleb's going to pick what he likes pre-snap, and he's going to run with it, right? In this case, he sees what looks like one of these corners with his foot pointed or er, like with his back foot towards the back of the end zone, which means he might be dropping. And if he's rotating, then this guy's going to be really open. And if he's not, he's going to be open enough, right? So snap, get the ball there. Ball sinks on us a little bit. If you want to be very critical, if you'd like to, you can. I mean, Caleb had, I don't see any real consistent issues with Caleb's accuracy. Plenty of quarterbacks just snag it sometimes. But so it's more to say that that's a simplistic pre-snap read that gives you a decent idea of how the air raid works. It's not what the air raid isn't is here is your one read and then here is your two read and here is your three read. If your two read isn't there and if you don't like that, check it down. Bad drawing, to be honest with you. That's not a great play concept. but. That's the NFL, and that's not the air raid. And so there are pieces of what Caleb does on a play to play basis that Kurt Warner is going to look at and he's going to say, This is so simple. What are they teaching him? Welcome to college offense, bro. Like, that stuff's all over. Just in terms of begging the question on what on earth are they doing? Another thing worth remembering. All right. So, silly, silly idea, but worth talking about. Uh, did I see we have 100 people in here? so much i appreciate you what's caleb doing here he's reorganizing the offense what's the biggest difference all right i'm gonna ask you this <clears throat> i'm gonna give you nearly no leading questions okay what is the biggest difference at this moment between caleb's life in the nfl and caleb's life in college here i'll back it up from what i show you right now third and nine okay third and nine what does caleb have to deal with in college that he doesn't have to deal with in the NFL? There's a specific answer I'm looking for. Here's a hint. This thing makes quarterbacks look smarter in the NFL. Do you know what it is? Let me give you 10 seconds. It's not NIL 4P. Closing up. No guesses. That's okay. I appreciate you guys anyways. It's the headset. Remember, Caleb Williams is going to get to talk to Shane Waldron until the 15 second mark. Under all circumstances. How much is Shane going to say to Caleb? I don't know. Never been in that headset. Right? But in college, Caleb has to just adjust its stag. Right? Like maybe you're going to get those guys where they clap and look at the sideline. And then the coach tells him what to do. But in the or in the NFL, Caleb gets to be wired in with his offensive coordinator. Here, Caleb has to adjust what he sees based on what is uh, based on what is just sitting on the field. And Donald, you may get a little bit of a signal from the sideline, but 
Show me where Caleb looks at the sideline. I guess you could say it's right here. Maybe he takes a small look, but he still has to make all the calls and adjustments himself. That's not to, you know, treat it all with kid gloves. It just seems as if the collegiate offense is a little bit more streamlined, in part because they don't want to weigh the quarterback down with too much. Now, here, we can see that Colorado is starting out in what looks like it's going to be. Now, this tells you it might be man, maybe it's cover three, but you've got two safeties up here, and you're thinking this probably could be some kind of cover two. And then as they adjust, here comes the creeper, creeper comes down, never mind, we're in cover three, right? And now that we're in cover three, Caleb is going to read this, I think, really nicely. He sees, okay, I've got a big slant right here from, I think it's Taj, and behind it, I've got a dig that can convert into a curl if he sees zone space, right? So he sees one, two, three, four, five guys on the line with what easily could be two more blitzing, right? So this looks as if we're hot. Catch takes a look because he thinks we're hot, except that he catches that there is a linebacker dropping and he catches it right there, right? Ready to throw, ready to throw, feels that there's no pressure, sees why, moves on. Brandon Rice, second read, flicks the ball out. Now, if you followed me on Twitter, you've seen this before. But what I find most impressive about a play like this is that Caleb, because of that pump fake right there, is classically speaking a little late to Brandon Rice. We are well out of our break, right? Like, here, I'll, I'll rewind it and you can see this. We have... Dropped into space, we are getting ourselves open. But what really separates Caleb, I think, from Justin, sorry, Justin, you're the last Bears quarterback. I don't have anybody else to compare get to in this case, is that Caleb is able to get the ball out so quickly and with so much velocity that we can mimic being on time, right? We're a little late, but we're reasonably late, in part because our release looks like this. <laughs> Look at how much velo he gets on that ball. Like, within a couple frames. Four Pete actually reminds me of Bajan's release, but with like double the velo. It's fun to watch. It really is to me like watching most of those super sick quarterbacks that we all grew up watching. They all seem to have this just flick release where the ball explodes off their hand. And then, of course, you just get to the parts where Caleb is just so loose. He's like street balling on him. Like here they run their triple option. We're going to draw the defender. We're going to just know, like we don't need our lower body to just spin the ball out to 87. Whatever. A month ago. I was about to say, you said a week ago, and I was like, no way. Like you can't, you can't fool me. <laughs> Lloyd scores. Yay, Lloyd. Woo. I can believe it was a month ago. I'm going to be honest. It's been a minute, but it's not been that long. I'm thankful it's over. Simple stuff like this. What do we see here? All the blitz cues in the world, right? This is almost a pre-snap read on easy mode. We got two guys jumping up on the line. So what do we do? We play hot. Easy. Throw into space. 10 goes and gets us some yardage. It, it, it's easy. It should be easy. But most importantly, you're seeing, like, if you're there and you're listening to this, why am I bothering? Because not only is it fun, not only have you maybe not seen it, but it is simple easy stuff, right? Where we can recognize the information in front of us. That's a six man blitz, right? And we can just get the ball out quickly. Now they drop him out because they're trying to snipe him. But Caleb knows that he's got a hot route to 10. He and 10 make eye contact. Did we throw it within any anticipation? Some. We make eye contact first. But it's on time. Oh, and by the way, did you notice there was a rusher on him? 
I bet you didn't. That's another thing that I saw all over this Colorado tape that I thought was neat. There are a whole bunch of moments where Caleb's getting the ball out, but he doesn't he doesn't take a hit. Like, why would he take a hit? He's playing quickly enough and on time enough that you don't have to worry about this guy smoking Caleb, right? Are we hot? Yes, Caleb knows it. We've got an edge rusher crashing off the side. So we're out. Safe play with a first down. All the wild scrambles in the world are sick. They're really sweet. But this stuff sticks out to me. It's the stuff that originally sold me on Caleb, and I think you see it on a lot of his tape. Here, it's everything but the throw. Which, like, don't get me wrong. Again, is missing a throw cool? No. But at least it's on time. A mechanical mistake, we used to talk about this with Justin all the time. A mechanical mistake is better than a mental mistake. And from the mental aspect, we see play action operation. We see the ball thrown beautiful and easy and is too far. Now, he's hit enough of these that I'm not somehow terrified of them. Though, he's definitely not a perfect, accurate, like, quarterback. I actually think Caleb's accuracy gets a little oversold sometimes. And I really mean that. Now, before you get terrified, I think Caleb's accuracy... <coughs> here is rock solid. I think his accuracy here is rock solid. I think his accuracy much deeper is fine. But that's that's the other thing, Donald. You mentioned, is there such thing? Most adjusted deep ball completions are like 55% when you look across the league. And that's a high mark. Sometimes they're 45% or 40%, depending on the quarterback. So, Donald, to your point, the moment you attempt a throw over 20 yards, there is a better than average chance it's not completed under all circumstances. But there's something to be said for if you're throwing a frozen rope. You're, uh, the better way I'd put this, Donald, is the moment you choose to throw a frozen rope like this, it's a little more on you to be accurate because you didn't float the ball. When you do put a little bit of air under it, so long as you put it into a relatively safe location, you're trading yak for a guaranteed play on the ball. And that's just a balanced thing. But also, if Caleb said it's open, or it, I would assume Caleb just threw it naturally, and I'm not worried about that. But so, uh, let's see. Is it crazy to say that even when accounting for the jump in talent from NCAA to NFL, that Caleb will have more support in his rookie year than his last year at USC, even relevant or relative to the league? Phil, that's the hard part here, right? I'm glad you asked. Because when you look across the NFL, especially when you look across the NFL recently, what do you see in quarterbacks? Most of the time you see quarterbacks that faced adversity in college. Like, Phil, that's that's what's funny to me, right? And this is not me coming after Jordan. Jordan, you know that. Like, usually the J.J. McCarthy types end up more A.J. McCarron than they do, like, really good. More often you get a Mac Jones. More often, you get a, I can't use that one, a Justin Fields. Uh, in, in many cases, you do. And all kinds of people will look at tapes like USC and they'll say, well, Caleb's not going to be able to do that in the NFL. Well, in the NFL, his line's going to be better. His receivers are going to be better. His tight end room's going to be better. His run game will probably have a lot more cohesion to it. He won't have to do something on every play. Have you guys noticed that we're watching this USC tape and there's like not a play where Caleb doesn't do anything. I mean, that's exhausting. I mean, look, far be it from me to cry crocodile tears over a quarterback. But there's something a lot harder about doing everything than playing your part. And I think we know that, right? Uh, and so I can't help but look at Caleb, to your point, and say the jump in... The, the jump in talent level that Caleb will be with and the jump in difficulty that he's playing against is, I think, about equi equitable. Hopefully, it's even better. Like, hopefully, Caleb feels like he's got an advantage. Hopefully. But at the very least, I think you could make the argument that the support he gets from the Bears kind of nulls out with the uh, problems he deals with other teams. But that's what I'm thinking. And, and I'm with you. Like, that's the other thing, Jordan. I like McCarthy. 
I, I'm not trying to take a darn thing away from McCarthy. I'm more saying that it is less common to find a good quarterback amidst a great team than it is to find a good quarterback on Wyoming. <laughs> like, you normally tend to find the guy playing for Purdue or for Cal or for, um, I couldn't tell you where Philip Rivers played <laughs> in college football. It's, it's less common. You get them from that blue blood program that outputted the superstar. And when they did, you ask Michigan's coach and he wanted to play Drew Hansen instead. Like, adversity seems to create these quarterbacks. NC State, well, that's wild. So NC State put out Philip Rivers, uh, Russ Wilson, and Mike Glennon within like a 25-year period. Okay, Wolfpack. <laughs> All right, I see you. I see you. But so, now there are plenty of moments, and I'm serious, where I think Caleb's willingness to take the throw and his accuracy don't always align. Like, kudos to, uh, kudos in my opinion to Caleb for being able to try some of these things. Look at this. Like, mechanically, look at what Caleb is doing here because it is a little ridiculous, right? But we, in the NFL, we don't want to miss throws. Now, they'll happen right? Hey, a missed throw is a glorified throwaway. And we can look back at this and we can say, well, yeah, our, like our tackle Nyon embarrassed himself. Like he comes back to pick off a DB blitz. Caleb is trying to step up in the pocket, but he gets smoked by the blitzer and we're happy we get the throw off, but also we miss it by quite a bit, or at least we miscommunicate on where we're trying to go. Right? Because this is obviously like quite different angles and it sure seems as if the receiver knows it a little later, but we appreciate the fact that this is how I scout in college. Okay. This is just me. The fact that Caleb can just whip the ball and it pops off his hand and rockets. What is that? Fifteen, some thirty-five yard or thirty yards downfield from the far hash, or from like right here. That's a sweet throw. <clears throat> the arm strength and the purity to just no step this thing. That's really nice. Like plant biomechanically, that's insane. We just you know don't want it to be an incompletion forever. But third and ten. You get three downs for a reason. And <laughs> welcome to Chicago, right? <laughs> movement, movement, movement. Get it out. It looked to me like this is a screen, just based on the way that the line is moving and the things didn't come together. But it also kind of looks like a broken play. I think it's a screen and Marshawn's just supposed to be there. But he got blocked up. And here's Caleb running the ball. Caleb's got a nasty agility kit. Guys have real trouble keeping pace with him. Like, I see this stuff on his tape all the time. Where is Caleb fast? Not like fast. He's just really good at freezing people. And you see it all over the place, which it'll have its moments. It mostly comes in handy, I think, in his pocket, or in the pocket, but it's fun when it pops up. This play is filthy. Boom. A little bit more of a results play, because we love the good results, but also a nice reminder that Lincoln Riley's offense is, it has, it has messy moments. Like, it looks to me like Caleb is seeing this and he's thinking it's probably some iteration of two man, but he might also be thinking zone because 15 not paying any attention to him. Um, like, and so you got to like a little man lock back here. Maybe for all, you know, they're playing poach or something like that, which would basically have this guy shading over to right here. In fact, I think that's what they go for. 
which is, yeah, I think it's Poach, which is basically two. It's like cover two like, but you end up with this one shading inside to take any vertical that's coming. So Colorado passes off the underneath route pretty well. And then this safety jumps on the slant that's supposed to capitalize on the space. So could Caleb, and this is where I wonder what he'll change in the NFL, could Caleb have theoretically ripped this ball right here and Keenan Allen gone and tracked it down? I think he could have. But it's not classically open. Like, it's open because this guy hesitates. It's not open because of the concept, right? And so then two goes in, or like moves into space, and this safety can drive on that at any point. So now Caleb is going to progress to this curl, which, if you can't tell, that's not open because we've got a defender sitting underneath it. And then we've got a throw to the flat with a man driving on it. So Caleb just works, gets creative, realizes that he's got 37 frozen right about here. Hits him with, let me see, it's, yeah, right here, he hits him with a little bit of a pump fake just because he realizes that his guy is separating clean. And then it looks like he's literally waiting for him to turn around. Sees the head come back around, and at that point, the ball's out. Tracks it. See you later. And it's funny, right? Is this good quarterbacking? Well, it's it's kind of ugly, right? It's sort of a beautiful mess, if you will. Caleb processes the information well, but the fact that he has to work <coughs> the fact that he has to work from here all the way over here and then work all the way back over here to me feels inefficient in terms of how he's going to make his reads. We love that he's creative enough. We love that he's got the physical ability to just I mean, my goodness. Gotcha. Uh, I'm going to need you to reteach me, Poach. It's not exactly the same, but you get what I'm going for. <laughs> I mean, I think it's fun. Is Poach at a two high, Brandon? Because that one ended up a little more one high uh, than I remembered it. I'm going entirely off of what I remember from some of these games. And especially because whether it's Poach or whether it's Palms or whether it's this, that, or the other, as long as I can get a sense for what the guy's responsibilities are, I, I generally just don't think that hard about it. But that's where football gets funny or funny. Because if you get the gist, but you call something the wrong thing, there's going to be some coach out there that's going to call you a dumbass. But that's life. Let me see. Is this the red zone set? It's not the entire red zone set. There's a couple of them. Man. See, I think this stuff is so a whole lot of people talk about structure and it's funny for P because you talk about how Colorado's defense is bad. Uh, they're not good, but also this kind of play right here. This is very NFL. If you ask me where the first read gets open guys, the first read gets open in the NFL a lot, right? We got mad at Justin a couple times on this channel because the first read was there and we didn't throw it. It's not a bad thing for a quarterback to hit his first read, especially when we get blitzed right here. So we've got a six man blitz 
coming down the pipe and we have to live. We just have to stay alive and then get the throw off, right? Like our back does not give us much here, but we just have to keep it alive, keep it alive, keep it alive because Brendan Rice is getting bodied. Sorry, Brendan. Like, look at this. Brandon Rice is trying to get open on a slant that converts into a corner route, right? And he just gets locked right there and ends up kind of in the way. But Caleb sinks and sinks and sinks. And remember what we talked about? So we've talked about this before. A man is right here. Is Justin throwing it? I don't think he is. I hope I'm at the point, and I hope we've gotten enough distance from it, where I'm not about to get labeled a hater for saying that. But in my experience, Justin would try to run from here, and he might actually beat this guy. And then he might walk into the end zone. And then everybody might say, wow, that's amazing, right? But Justin, did, as I have seen it, doesn't throw this ball. Because Justin wants to rock off his... You say that, Chicago, let's not go there. Justin wants to plant off his back foot and drive the football. And because of that, that means that if somebody's coming at him, he will not, he will not step into him and decapitate himself. Caleb just pulls his foot back and uses the natural torque that just comes truly easy to him and rips a beautiful ball for a touchdown. And I think it's so funny the receiver is celebrating. Not because he can't er, celebrate. 15 did a good job. But what a, what a sick throw. It's so simple. Of course it's simple. But it's not easy. Because there's a lot of guys closing quickly on him. No need to make too much of it. This is life in the NFL. Right? 4P, uh, if you can remind me which one it is. I'm going to be or like, I'll happily go back and see it. I don't remember him being under pressure, at least not from like 15 yards depth, but I'm not trying to be a hater. Like I don't remember, or I remember Justin making a clean pocket throw to Mooney. Uh, let me see in the Buffalo game. I want to say like, it's not as if Justin can't make this throw or something like that. It's that staying alive against a blitz while you're waiting for your crosser to come open and then drilling the crosser in the second window, to me is really pretty. When I think NFL quarterbacking, that's what I think, is staying alive in a mucky pocket and making a throw that nobody remembers how hard it was. That's the best way to put this thing, right? Like, to me, the NFL is... Oh, was that the Khalil Herbert one? The one where he, like danced with a guy and then threw past him because that's that happened. That was sweet. And we liked it. But so uh, what I'm always thinking about with the NFL, the longer I've watched uh, NFL football and studied it with you guys, NFL throws are the throws where when you watched it live, you'd never realized that the throw was that hard. Right. But then you go back and you break down like, What's going on with this guy turning straight into his eye line, right? And you realize the focus, the talent that it takes to just whip the ball into place and make it look wide open and easy, right? Because this looks like, wow, this is a layup. It's a layup if you're really good. <laughs> That's really hard. It's part of what makes quarterbacks so hard. Let me see, where are they? Uh, we'll come back to this spot in the game. There's one spot I want to skip to. Is it, uh, is it here? No, it's not. Let me see. Because I think these are gross in the most beautiful way possible. You know, if you're a fan, anyways. Let me see. Stuff like this, okay, so this is not the world's best example, but defender bearing down, 
quick little throw. Tell me, Donald, that this doesn't look like Aaron. And always will, right? We've spent years going, oh, well, there's a defender in his face. How is he supposed to throw that? And we just flick the ball over the top, wide open receiver, defender mad at the rest of his team. (laughs) You see that? (coughs) This is what I want out of my quarterback. Like, I want to see defenders getting pissed at that being so open. Like, what are we doing? Yeah, I hope so. Right? Just easy. Let me see. Where do I put these plays? That one's sweet. This one's dirty. So I could show other examples, but I like this one a lot. Um, Because another part about Caleb that I think is really sweet is that now and again, and you might make the argument that this throw just got affected by pressure. It's not that he can't make a tough throw or like, it's not that he won't make a throw while getting hit because he will. But also now and again, Caleb will recognize we've got man. Because we've got man, and we're running a curl here, a curl here, and a slot fade, the same play that we run a lot, we're going to have all kinds of space. I'm just going to lay this ball into that space and let my guy go make a play on it. And that's what he does. He just flicks it into space for the freshman, Zachariah Branch, and Branch comes back for the ball, plucks it out of the air, and it's a 15-yard gain. It feels to me like it is a skill in and of itself to be willing to put the ball up for your guy to go get it. Not always. You don't always need to do this. I mean, it's just a trust ball. But it's sweet to see trust balls. Like you're saying, Arathic, I think when you see trust balls, that's a unilateral good thing. Are these the plays I'm looking for? Oh, I think they are. How sick is that? Brandon, have you seen this one before? Like, it's so simple. But to go from the mesh point to just loading off your right foot and throwing a slant like that, that is filthy. Rice does not catch it. But biomechanically, the torque he generates is bananas. And then second and three becomes third and three. So then on third and three, we get blitzed. We have to get the ball out. Rice wins for us. Because Rice is just going to hit another slant. Skip. Bang. Easy. And Caleb pulls his left foot back and just falls over because this guy falls on him. It's easy football looking easy. Now, the inter- it is, isn't it, Brandon? And again, they blitz us and they get us, right? Like they're bringing, what is this, a six-man blitz? And they annihilate Marshawn Lloyd. Like, they smoke him. But Caleb knows Rice beat him. And he'll be damned if he doesn't get the football off. So he does. Touchdown. Easy. Let me see. Where's the... uh... Now, I feel like because... We're saying so many good things. Let me see. I have to find it. I at least have to mention 
a couple of these where it's like we've talked about some inaccuracies so you know we're not being totally like one-sided here we're obviously biased i won't blame anybody for saying that i'm looking for his interception I can't remember where it is because it is absolutely ludicrously silly, silly bad. It has to be. No, this one's okay. That one was wild. What does that mean, Donald? What do you mean it's QB paid by numbers? <coughs> Here, I think Caleb leaves the ball out a little too far. You could say something about QB timing, but I love that he rips it over the middle. I love that he understands the space he needs to attack. We just leave the ball out too far. And miss him. So again, accuracy, little come and go. But we also all do this, right? We always point out a lot of these quarterbacks and we make it sound like they have to hit every single throw under the sun. And we would like it if they hit them all, right? But in many cases, you hit a nice or you hit a quick slant in the second window and you do it where they can catch it in stride, you'll be all right. I don't know, it's it's weird with Caleb, right? I would love to see him be a little more accurate. Who wouldn't? And I mean that. But also, I can't help looking at Caleb and think, he's gonna be fine. He hits plenty. His accuracy is not a problem. It's just easy to get caught up in hoping and looking for perfection when it comes to these things. Evaluating QBs is weird. Is it really this late in the game? I guess it is. Here's the interception. You've probably heard about this one. Caleb looks to his left, gets pressured immediately. So Colorado started sending a whole bunch of blitzes that we didn't go through the whole game. We're not going through. Got, we're not going to. I told everybody that we would be done. We weren't done. I have to close up soon. But so Colorado's going to send a blitz on what looks like. I don't know if it's like play action. I don't know what the guard's doing. I mean, he's pulling around, but the moment he does, we get heated up immediately. So Caleb's going to look for what looks like an over route running over here. Immediately has to move. Sees four Zachariah Branch absolutely hog wild open and casually seems to think that fading sideways, he's got the arm to get this thing from the 15-yard line to, like, the 35. So Caleb just decided that he's going to be able to torque out a 50-yard throw. He cannot do it. <laughs> this is one of those the gall kinds of moments, right? Because, hey, if Caleb... E if all Caleb needs to do is run a little more, step forward, and then throw it, and he can get it there, then like, okay, lesson learned. I guess you aren't like literally Superman. Because this throw is silly. Even attempting it is silly. N nobody could do that. I guess Mahomes could, right? Maybe he's just feeling it. But dude's open. If you do may if you do get it there, like the read isn't wrong. You just you just can't really I mean, when you throw an interception like this, it's always gonna look kind of funny. Like I could say you can't throw that. Meh. If you've got the arm to get it there, just just get it there. Zach Wilson actually might make that throw. And I think frankly, if you gave Caleb another try, Caleb might make that throw. But he doesn't here. Whoops. And yeah, 4P, I mean, one thing you're getting at that I think is totally fair and reasonable is that we're excited uh, about Caleb Williams, and that's going to make it to where everything that's easy, we're going to act like it's all really hard. And some of it, Caleb, just the flair he plays with is always going to make it look more difficult than it is. 
right? And so, like you're saying, turning around and hitting a wide open tight end, who cares? I agree with you. That's not going into the highlight reel. Like, that's not my real, or that's not in my, uh, I guess, case to be made of, man, is he good or what? And I use that. More that I appreciate that the easy things remain easy. You hope they do. There's one more play I want to talk about. And I talked to, or, and I at least posted this one on Twitter, but I think it is just sicko mode. Right, Iceberg? The heat check, right? Oh, yeah, that one's really nasty. What was this one? Second and ten. Well, that ain't so bad. I think you caught that for a first down, too. Play action. We're, he we're heated up again. Under pressure. We have to throw with a lot of anticipation. We put the ball in a spot where only our guy can get it. And look at how tight this window is. Defender does a good job contesting it. Just a little behind. And it's not that it's hard. It's not that hard. It's that it's precise. The parts of it move as you'd hope they would. Set. Ball out. Blitzer had a lot of time to get home on this too. Set, ball out. First down. No, I hear you, 4P. Hear me as excited, not putting pressure on him. If you can trust me to do anything, it's to not expect rookies to do anything. Because I personally tend to think that that is a recipe for problems. Expectations to me are sort of a thief of joy among sports. Not always, but a lot. I just happen to actually have... No. Need to remember where this thing is. There's the pick. Sorry about this, fam. I'm literally looking for one play I have in mind. Oh, what is this one? This is a multi multi piece read. Yes. Nothing too nutty. He just sees the dropping linebacker right there and says, I don't know about that. Adjust back the other way. Finds his man for a nice little completion. Basic stuff. But the basics feel easy. Don't worry about that.
Yep. All right. This one to me was one of the nastiest plays. Brandon, are you still in here? So it's third down and like 10, or it's third and 14. So obviously we're trying to go from here to what? Roughly here for the sticks. Not a ton of plays for third and 14. And they any play that you have for third and 14 is going to get that much harder when you immediately lose on a four-man rush on your uh, your right-hand side. So we're looking at potentially like an out and a slot fade. But it gets pretty tough when almost instantly you got to get way off your spot. But then at that point, Caleb is taking a look at this guy right here who's running just a curl on the other side of it. And he's already waiting for him to get out of his break because he's curling right about at the sticks. As he fades, or as he tries to create a little bit more space, he recognizes that we are not winning up front in either of these spots either. So he sinks backwards, creates a little more space. And then, just as his guys start to lose, he zips a ball out to 15, who comes back for the ball, picks up a solid 7-8 yards, and does not pick up the first down. But this pocket movement and the ultimate throw that he makes are filthy. Like, Phil, when you say odds of Tyler Scott becoming anything, I look at this and I'm like, well, in a world where Tyler Scott catches an underneath ball like this, and that defender is out covering DJ Moore, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, Tyler Scott may turn up field and break a tackle here because Tyler, Tyler's got some quickness. So if Tyler outruns this DB, does he become a minor star in Chicago? Like Randall Cobb, right? Could that happen? It's not out of the question, right? So it's just a matter of, I don't know, how good is Caleb? How quick is Caleb? Or like, is qu how quick is Caleb to become that good? And what changes? What does, or like, who in the Bears locker room builds a connection with them? We'll see. But I look at this stuff and I think to myself, like, the best way I could put this, um, in my opinion, Donald, is when I'm watching tape like this, I see way more tools than just create, or like, just a creative player that does things out of structure. If anything, I actually see an ability to extend within structure that is really hard to find. Like, Jared Goff is a bona fide NFL quarterback. I think Jared Goff... I actually don't know what happens to Jared. Like, maybe Jared, knowing what he knows now, steps up and rips a ball deep. Maybe. But also, our tackle doesn't help us at all. Like... This is one difference about the NFL. Somebody asked earlier, what do you think about Caleb's supporting cast? I'll tell you right now, if Darnell Wright ever gets beat this badly, I will be blown away. Like, this tackle is hopelessly non-competitive as this defensive lineman <laughs> bends the edge, like, right here. <clears throat> bad rep, bad rep from 76. And so the hope is that the pockets, while, you know, they're not going to be clean, you're up against NFLers, aren't that ugly. Like, that's, that's horrible. But somehow, for as much as we hear, like, Caleb can't play with his structure, Donald, don't you think this seems like an awfully intense commitment to structure from that same player? Like, Caleb could have tried to scramble. Steps up in the pocket, pull the ball down and run. He just knows he's not going to pick up 14 yards with his feet. <clears throat> so he's going to try to throw for it. Doesn't work. But even if you only get two first downs that way, you got a lot more, or you got a much better chance. I'm excited. I think the Bears are in a really good spot. I can't wait to watch this draft. I can't wait to see what happens next. The Bears are adding a quarterback. 
that I'm really excited about. And we're about to cross the event horizon where we get to just talk about it openly. Not that we haven't already been. But there was a while there where we kind of couldn't. And next week, we'll talk more about what the Bears may do in the draft. Hopefully, we'll have a little bit more information. I'm so ready so that we can talk about what things are going to look like. I want to uh, review some of the rookies. Take a look at Darnell Wright's tape. Take a look at Kervon Dexter's tape. Maybe some of the sophomores too, but especially Tyreek Stevenson. You have to know that the Tyreek Stevenson video is coming. I want to do more video stuff. If you want to help the channel, here's how you're going to do it, okay? The streams, okay? I like the streams. I know if you're here, you like the streams because you're a football sicko. The streams are always going to be pretty hard capped. I am not. That is not lost on me, right? The pod, the podcast is a nice thing to grow, <clears throat> but what's really going to pop is going to be videos. So if I make a good video, show other people. Give it a like. Give it a retweet. All that other stuff, right? <clears throat> the streams are too long. So as far as YouTube watch time goes, the people that watch it are going to watch it, and the people that aren't aren't even going to click on it. They're going to go, that's too long. I'm not going to do it. And I don't blame them, right? When JT O'Sullivan posts a video and it's 18 minutes long, it takes me actually creating time in my day to, to watch it. So I get it. But I'm really interested to see what these bears do over the next couple of weeks. Or like basically over just like the next two weeks. And then after that, we'll make some videos. We'll do it during the dry time of Bears content. And I think we'll have a lot of fun. I do. Uh, <laughs> did he really, Jordan? I'm not surprised. Uh, he's doing some more X's No stuff, which is great. I, I need to... Uh, on Mesh? Man, that's sweet. All this to say, we're in a good spot, guys. We're in, we're in a really good spot. And I can't wait to see what the Bears do. Call me an optimist. It'll be really hard to disappoint me. For years. I'll close on this. For years, I have felt like I have had to explain to people why the Bears, our favorite team, weren't going to be that good. Please don't put that much emotional investment into them. It's going to be a hard year. Donald, I feel like you and I have particularly had to have that conversation a couple times. Where in 22, it was like, this is not going to go well. In 23, as the corner turned, it was like, this is, this is not going to get much better. And if it does, great. But it might not get much better. And in 20, it was like, maybe? Oh, uh, no. In 2019 was, I think, my first season of having to do it. And this is the most rationally excited I've ever been while creating content for the Bears, or like about the Bears. Y'all, I don't say this every year. I'll talk about how there are fun things to watch. I'll talk about how hopefully this happens. But rationally these bears don't have to do that much to win some football games i mean that's the core here right guys like the other funny part to this jordan is that you are as good as your record says you are except that's not true at all is it jordan because if you play an incredibly hard schedule in the afc and the bears eat up a bunch of cupcakes why are they better than you just because they went 10 and 7 Right. The funny part to me about this Bears schedule is the Bears have seemingly nearly every advantage here, like to be much more fun than we're willing to admit. Y'all just to use sit. They play. Here's here's five games to throw at you. They play the Vikings twice. They play the commanders. They play. The Patriots, they play the Panthers. 
That's five of their games. Now, I'm not trying to say they're all wins, but wouldn't you hope the Bears are building a team that can win those five games? You would hope. But <clears throat> that's not even me trying to just hate hate on the Vikings either, Jordan. I think the Vikings are an unusual team because offensively they have a lot of bones, but their um their defensive talent is a problem. Like it's it's so funny to me. And I don't really know what to think about it. Like you mentioned Vikings with JJ McCarthy or Drake May should scare the Bears. I mean, I don't know if they should be like really scary though. Just because I don't know how JJ's going to play as a rookie long term, sure. Especially with May. But JJ is a rookie playing quickly? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know though. Like, and that's the thing. That's the other, yes, uh, by the way. Uh, erotic yes um where he did jordan jordan but so uh and sir lord they may not the funny part about the playoffs is that with the dawn of the seven seed a lot of teams that don't uh a lot of teams that don't deserve it make it anyways right joe excited to see you thanks so much for making it uh, we're about to close up but that doesn't mean that I don't love you anyways. But so, Sir Lord, it's it's funny, right? I don't know if the Bears are good enough. Like, maybe not for that. But I also think that, Sir Lord, let me put it this way, okay? It's not that I think the Bears are amazing. The Bears have a lot of things that shouldn't be working for them. Or, like, that they they won't, you can't assume that they'll be working for them next year. The other, because Arothic mentions we got to have off season. It's all with that, or op- optimism in the off season. The other piece of this, Sir Lord, is that the Bears shouldn't have beaten the Lions, but they nearly did twice, and they did once. They may not beat the Packers, but there's 15 other games. And I can't help but look at this team and think they play some bad ones. And if the Cardinals and the and these are all ifs, I get it. But if the Cardinals and the Commanders and the Panthers and the Patriots spot the Bears four wins, and then you add two losses to the Packers. Dude, if we're doing the whole rest of the schedule, starting with a four and two record, I think we can get to nine and eight. You know what I'm saying, Sir Lord? Like, if you're telling me That against the rest of the schedule, including the Vikings, they got to go. What what did I make that? So if they were four and two, that means that they would have to go. Five and seven the rest of the way to end up nine and eight. That would be sniffing the playoffs, right? The Bears were seven and ten. They sniffed the playoffs. It, It depends on what you call sniffing, I guess. Like to me. If you play your week 18 game with playoffs on the line, I think you sniffed. What do you think? I can put that one back to the chat. (laughs) Like, uh, let's see. And that's the other piece. Like the, or that Detroit may have an easier time defending the bears, but also maybe Caleb just runs a crazy amount. Who knows? And sir, Lord, I'm right there with you. Like, just so we're on the same page, I'm not trying to sell you on the Bears are going to be amazing, right? I think they could be surprising, but surprising doesn't immediately mean that they're going to be that mature level of good that you see from a lot of teams with a little bit of seasoning, right? But I also wouldn't be shocked if an injection of talent in the defense keeps the defense buzzing a little bit. And then on top of that, if Caleb hits his stride, if Caleb doesn't get hurt, I would expect him to hit a stride around week 10. And I don't know where that'll settle for him. It's not like I think he's going to throw for 300 yards a week, but who knows? Anyways, I got to get some sleep. Y'all, always great hanging. Great catching up. 
I, I'm I'm hoping for exciting as well. You might as well. I do think the Bears are talented enough where, especially with Keenan Allen, it's very possible that they could make some actual noise. Minor noise. A din, but noise nevertheless. Y'all, like the stream if you haven't. Comment for the algorithm. Uh, I appreciate you. Have a wonderful week. Bear with us. We'll hit you probably on Friday. Something like that. Uh, subscribe to that if you haven't. If you like, bear with us. We could we could use any Apple review or Spotify review or Spotify five star that you're willing to offer us. Uh, have a great one, Bears fans, and I'll catch you soon. Oh, a bear.